All right, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Uh, the ONJ Roberts School District Board of Board uses the working session process as a way to consider agenda items as one large committee for the purposes of discussion and debate in full view of the public. It's not a time for the public to engage with the board, rather a time for the public to observe the work of the various committees. Uh, with that, we're gonna start with the school perceptions survey. I'll turn it over to Dr. Stout. Sure, thank you, Mr. Friel. Um, I want to start this evening with talking about um, a vendor that we're bringing forward to do our survey work moving forward. Um, interestingly, uh, this was discussed at a board working session on March 11th, 2021. Uh, but unfortunately, due to COVID and some of the other things that were keeping us preoccupied, this was put on hold for a while. But just a little bit of an overview, you know, back in March of last year, uh, there was a committee of the board that was looking at several different vendors um, for um, for surveying uh, the district. Um, based off of those uh, different vendors that they were looking at, School Perceptions was the leading uh, company at that time. And throughout our, our research, when we started picking that up again, they, they came out on top. So I, I, I have a representative this evening from School Perceptions, uh, Dr. Rob Demuse, who's going to just uh, talk briefly about some of the services they provide and answer questions that you have. But just as an overview, you know, surveying our community is part of our uh, goals for this year. And what we, would, what we would be looking to do would be doing a survey with our students, a survey with our staff, and then a survey with our parents as well. So we're looking at three different surveys that we would administer this spring, and then we would administer it every year thereafter so that we would have longitudinal data to let us know how we're doing as a district. So at this point, uh, Paul, if we could zoom him in. Hey, Rob, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Of course, thanks so much for having me. And I do have a short presentation. So the, the, the powers that be here, if I could um, have the ability to share, I know with great power comes my responsibility. So you, you are co-host now, you can share your screen. Perfect, thank you so much. And fortunately, I can see myself right ahead back here. So I know it looks no, it looks like I'm sharing. I'm happy to have my face a little smaller behind you. Uh, so I wanted to do a little conversation about who we are, who I am, and some of the potential services that we would be able to provide you. Um, so um, who are we at School Perceptions? So you'd probably have conversations with uh, with three people. We'd be your your um, your leaders. Uh, I would serve as your account manager. Um, very briefly about me, I serve as the research director at School Perceptions. So in a nutshell. Uh, I make sure that our surveys measure what they purport to measure. Um, I'm born and raised in northeastern Wisconsin, um, and I was a high school social studies teacher. Uh, and then for reasons that I'm still trying to come to terms with, I decided I wanted to go to graduate school. Uh, best thing about graduate school is that it ends at some point, so that's good. Um, and I primarily studied uh, political behavior in school referendums. Um, so why people vote yes, why people vote no, uh, and why they change their mind or not. Um, so I found pretty, a pretty natural home at school perceptions because once that teacher hat goes on, it is firmly on, it does not come off. I'm very proud of that. Uh, but also we do a lot of work as well for community surveys and the side of um, trying to help districts understand um, whether a bond or, a, or a, a levy will pass in their particular district. So all that's to say, I kind of have my hand in both worlds, our staff, student, and parent side of things um, and our community surveys as well. Um, we had a couple of conversations, in fact, right around this time last year, as you just mentioned, Bill Foster was on a call. He's our president and founder. And then Carrie Uterman is our project implementation manager. So she is our all things uh, survey guru in terms of making sure that once we have a, a finalized survey that we have a bow on, um, that it is ready to go out to your particular stakeholders, be it um, staff, students, or uh, parents. Uh, about us more generally as a company, so we are an independent Wisconsin-based education research firm. Um, and this is, really isn't our first rodeo. Um, we started uh, 20 years ago. In fact, we just celebrated our 20th birthday, so now entering year 21. Um, and in those now 20 years, our mission has never changed. We help educational leaders gather, organize, and use data to make strategic decisions. Um, in these now coming in 21 years, uh, we've uh, administered more than 10,000 surveys in over 850 schools um, across, the, uh, across the country. And we primarily work with four major groups, school districts. Um, ESSA is kind of a, a different name. We actually just finished up a project at CIU 10 um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we call them CSIS in Wisconsin. 
um, state organizations and national organizations as well. So in terms of logistics and process for a stakeholder survey, um, we, a couple of tenets that we hold very firmly at School Perceptions, uh, we believe that doing a survey helps educate your stakeholders on your plans. And I'll have a bit more to say about this, uh, but really we see our surveys as two sides of the coin. And a couple of years ago, a district administrator described our survey as an interactive newsletter, and it was a pretty high compliment. We think that our survey should do two things. Um, it should educate people on the plans that you have done or what you want from your sta survey stakeholders. And just as importantly, um, what it is that you're going to do with the data. Um, nothing creates more cynicism and, and, and um, you know, the reluctance to fill out a survey if it feels like a, a box checking process. Um, the number one thing that increases response rates isn't necessarily timing. It, it's not necessarily when the survey is open. Um, it is, it is a, a district or an organization being upfront and saying, if you take the time to take this survey, here is what we assure you we are going to do with the data on the back end. Um, and letting people know that their feedback does mean something. So that's what I mean about educating st stakeholders. What is it that you've done? What is it you're planning to date? Um, and what is it that you're going to do with their data? And then we also do exactly what a survey should do, which is gather qualitative and quantitative information um, that you can use for your strategic planning, whether it be educational, academic priorities, or facility planning, or whatnot. Uh, by using us, we'll be able to compare you to similar districts when appropriate. Uh, we'll help you begin to build longitudinal data to measure your growth from year to year and collect basic overall satisfaction metrics. Um, these facets can lead to highly customized work, uh, but that's kind of a fine line. So on the one hand, we begin all of our surveys um, with some questions that we use right out of the box. And the reason we do that is because that's how we develop comparisons for you. Um, if you have customized questions specifically to your district, uh, well then by definition of being a customized question, we won't be able to provide you um, comparisons to other districts that look like you at Owen J. Roberts. Um, however, but by uh, using uh, uh, the, the questions that are already in our survey, you can do that. Uh, but it's really quite a flexible process. If you love a question, we'll keep it in. If you hate a question, we'll take it out. If you want to edit a question because it works better for you and rewarding it is something you want to do, then we'll do that. So this is a very malleable process. Um, the outcome of doing a survey, people are more likely to support your plans if they understand the plans and if they have an opportunity to evaluate the progress of your particular focus areas as you try to become um, a growth and academic strong school district. Our surveying approach, one thing that we do not do is random sampling. Um, and this is another one of our tenants that we feel very strongly about. Uh, we want everybody in your district, um, whether no matter what, what parent they are, no matter what staff member, no matter what student, uh, we want all of them to have the ability to not only be educated on what's going on in your district, but have the opportunity to weigh in. So what we don't want to have someone do is stand up in a board meeting a few weeks down the road and say, you never asked me, why didn't you ask me? You know, I, our, our district isn't that big, why couldn't you find time to ask for my opinion? Um, and that does happen, um, you know, with, with random sampling and sometimes those very influential community members by nature of it being random just don't become selected. Um, and in our case, uh, we don't do that. Um, we have everybody have the opportunity to provide you with feedback and we feel very passionate about that inclusive approach. So what are some of our survey components? Um, well, like I mentioned, um, what do our surveys look like? They become a hybrid approach designed to A, meet your specific and unique needs, but also generate comparison data for you um, when we can based on questions that other districts are using. So we have a short, uh, short opening information. We all often call this our opening letter. Um, on the first couple of uh, slides of a survey um, for a survey taker, it's really cut to, the cut to the chase. What is this thing landing in my email inbox? What do you want from me and how long is it gonna take me to do? Um, we ask for a couple of respondent and demographic information pieces. Um, you know, those might include things like, for instance, for a staff survey, it might be what building they work in, um, what their tenure is, or how long they've worked in the district. Uh, maybe sometimes what grade, what grade they teach or primarily work with. But this too is kind of a fine line because the more demographic information you ask, the less confidential the survey feels. Now we will, um, we will uh, prevent you from going too deep because this is a confidential survey. If you try to slice and dice the data too far, our survey system's going to stop you and say. Nope, that, that, that will reveal confidential information. Um, even with that roadblock in place, um, people will feel like they're, that they're going to be pinpointed if too many demographic information are there. Um, so we try to really help you think critically about what is the most important information that you want to collect from people. Uh, you might want to preview your current issues or planning background. In other words, why are you asking people to do a survey if that's valuable information? Certainly the actual survey items to measure and evaluate, and then overall satisfaction measuring metrics. 
So it might look something like this. You know, it might say, um, dear staff, the ONJ Roberts School District leadership is committed to ensuring that every employee has both a voice and a shared responsibility in the success of our schools. As part of our planning process, the district is reaching out to all staff to gain a better understanding of what we are doing well and where additional focus or resources are needed. To accomplish this goal, we need your feedback through this staff survey. The district has hired us, School Perceptions LLC, an independent education research firm with expertise in conducting school surveys to collect this data and ensure confidentiality. So I, I put that together just out of, for some stock language. We can, we can work with that, but that's kind of the point of what we do in an opening letter. Um, we provide the end the information for how people actually access the survey. So they'd go to our website, and then including it, it included in this email is a 16-character alphanumeric code that serves as our gatekeeping function. So once I, as a staff member, for instance, take the survey and I click submit or finish, that code goes away. Um, I am not allowed to continually access your survey and skew your data by taking the survey dozens and dozens of times. Um, once that goes away, that goes away forever. Now for a parent or family survey, we recognize that uh, maybe two spouses don't always agree and they have a different version of how they wanna take the survey, completely understandable. Um, so we can uh, more than happily provide you with some extra survey access codes, um, just in case two, two parents wanna take the survey and provide you with some different answers. Um, then um, we'll actually provide the potential items that go in there. So just to kind of give you a feel for how these are, are worded or how they're laid out, um, our staff check-in survey will help you answer questions like, are my employees engaged? Um, do I, as a district leader, have the insights needed to improve, improve employee morale? And how do our schools climate, culture, and environment compare to similar schools? So we might ask questions on an agreement scale that says, um, I have healthy working relationships with my coworkers, or our school student discipline practices and policies are effective. Um, our parents and community support the school district or the district seeks input, input from a broad group of staff members. For our parent or caregiver survey, um, this particular survey is meant to help you answer questions like, how does our engagement and satisfaction compare to similar schools? Um, where have we made improvements and where do we need to plan for additional resources? And are parents satisfied with our school communication efforts? So sample questions there might include whether the school has high expectations for my child, uh, do I, as a caregiver, believe my child gets help when they need it? Or if I, uh, I have at least one school staff member I feel comfortable contacting when I have an idea or a concern for them. And then finally, students, um, just to note, we do have two different versions of our student survey uh, based on the developmental level and the approachability. So we have one survey that's set up for students in grades four through eight. And then we have one survey that's set up for students in nine to 12. Obviously, they have different developmental benchmarks that they're going through. Reading levels are obviously vastly different. Uh, but nevertheless, regardless, uh, we will help you answer questions like what practices and policies help our students learn and what barriers are in the way? Do our students feel supported? And what can we do to increase student involvement both in and out of the classroom? So that might include questions like, uh, my teachers make their classes fun and interesting. I try my best at school. I feel safe at school. Or I have friends to sit with at lunch or hang out with at recess. What we like to keep in mind, um, simple and short, simple and short, simple and short. Um, these, th this is our, this is our mantra as we're making it as, as a survey, we want to remove any jargon, um, anything that would make sense only for people that are in a boardroom or a district district cabinet room. Uh, we really want to make sure that this survey is approachable and that it'd be language that no matter if you've been stepped into school in 40 years, since, since the time when, when desks were bolted to the floor, that your survey, that this survey is still going to make sense for you. Um, so jargon is gone. That's a big no, no. And we want it to be a very approachable, no matter, no matter who you are. Um, we've also gone through a process about a year and a half ago now um, that a longer survey is not a better survey. More words are more words that people don't read. And more words lead to a survey that people just get frustrated and they quit. And obviously that's the worst case scenario because if you're not getting data back, uh, then you're not getting good data to plan off of. Uh, people get fatigued when there's too many words. And so really what we went through is we, we kind of did a trim the fat exercise. And, 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 and we've learned as well that we don't need to ask a question four ways when it can be answered in one. Um, and that will really help your, your response rates go up as well. So looking ahead, what would this look like? If you wanted to implement something before the end of the year, um, the next step would be reviewing that proposal. And then we would use the next two-ish months to review survey drafts. Typically, the way that works is we'd hold an introductory meeting, and we would show you what these surveys look like out of the box so that you can feel how some of these uh, comparison questions are generated. Um, and then uh, your leadership team might take that back to their cabinet or, or their other district administrators and say, all right, um, what do we want to change? What do we want to add? What makes sense for us? What do we, we want to do with some open-ended questions? 
we'd review that again um, with me. Um, and then we'd, uh, we'd make those uh, cleanup and changes. Maybe we'd have another meeting back and forth. So usually the staff, student, and parent surveys go through about two to four iterations or so. Um, we'd finalize the survey um, in April. The survey would probably open then in April, um, depending on when your spring break lies. Uh, so typically what we do is we'd finalize the survey. Um, then that following week, uh, we would provide you with some email templates that would come from your communication channels that would go out to staff and parents and students. Kind of give them a heads up saying, hey, this is going to come out in the next week or so. Keep an eye on your inboxes. The survey would open. We like to keep it open for about two weeks. That's the sweet spot, uh, about two weeks and two weekends. Um, shorter is going to affect your response rates, but any longer than that really doesn't increase the response rates as well. Um, in about May or June, the board would be able to receive their results presentation. And then over the summer, they'd be able to think about their, their next steps. So let me pause there, um, take a little swig of water and see what questions you have for me. I'd be more than happy to answer them. I'll start out, I got a question for you. So um, when you're looking at your, hitting the whole potential universe of parents, how do you um, ensure that we get the, the broadest range and don't have selection bias and, and, and have whole populations sort of select themselves out and not get a really valid survey result? Yeah, so one way we do that is we, um, I'm not quite sure what platform you use, whether it's Skyward or PeachDAR, InfoCampus, or whatever your parent portal is. A couple of weeks before the survey goes out, um, we will work with you to export the parent email addresses out of there. Um, and then we'll upload this into our system so that everybody can have access to that code and be able to take it at least once. That seems to work the best. Um, our, our parent rates um, have really benefited from that system. And we do have a very strict privacy policy where the only thing we're going to use their email address for is to send them the survey. Uh, we don't bother them after that. The only, um, the only other communication they could potentially get from us is what we uh, politely call our slacker tracker. Um, so if you don't respond right away, we'll send you a, an email about a weekend that says, hey, um, we really want you to complete this. And then one more email reminder about a day or two before before the survey closes. Um, so we have found that, that that method of communication has worked best. But the other thing I would say is, again, that's simple and short, um, especially for parents that are working two to three jobs just to keep up. Um, there's not time to take a survey that, that's going to last 20, 25 minutes and so on. Um, the other things that we've seen that have worked well pre-COVID as well is having some some parent information nights, especially for uh, your, say, your, your Spanish-speaking families. Uh, and we've seen districts take some pretty creative routes of maybe having a, a, a family and food night where somebody can come in with uh, your ELL specialist and, and answer the survey questions live and get any translation help that they would need as well. So certainly we can work with you to translate the survey as well. Uh, but usually having that inclusive approach of at least touching everybody at least once and making sure the survey is very short and to the point um, seems to help. And you will be able to, to in, um, investigate some of that as well. We do have questions in our survey that uh, will ask parents uh, what types of services their children receive. So whether it's a 504 plan or special education services or gifted and talented. And then we'll be able to compare um, what, the, what the respondent bucket looks like versus how they're represented in your school district. And then so you'll have metrics that'll say this is va this validates the survey um, data versus we didn't get enough response of this particular group or or what we're looking for to have valid data. Mm -hmm. I have a I'm sorry if you mentioned this. Oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, I, I see we have a under optional uh, student data load. Mm -hmm. uh, now I assume we're going to request that. Is that correct, admin? I guess this is a question for the for everybody else. Yeah, that that's something that we would we would look to do. We would work with um, our tech department so that we can we can upload the data that way. Yes. Okay. And then the, which demog which the demographics are we going to be looking at? Like religion, uh, race, what what? Yeah, when we sit down with with the company to develop the questions, we'll we'll take a look at that. We're going to try and align it with. Um, with our state reporting systems and the demographics that are aligned there. Okay, thank you. Kathy? Okay, um, did you say how, when you say short, short and sweet, is there a, a target time for how long the survey should take? Um, yeah, the unsatisfying answer is it depends a little bit based on the survey group with our fourth graders. Um, as you can imagine, anything longer than 10 minutes is, you, <laughs> you might as well not even do the survey at that point. <laughs> um, but I would say with parents, um, it, 
I would say an estimate of about 10 to 15 minutes. And the reason the estimate is there is it all depends on how long somebody takes to, to fill in open-ended questions or how many you choose to include. Okay. And also, um, you mentioned how we could edit and we could just, you know, change questions and things like that. Well, I'm sure this, you know, from our past experience with surveys, we, uh, we don't want to be, you know, editing things so that we have leading questions and, you know, we could, we could probably fight it out a little bit on how we should edit a survey. So uh -huh. how would you help us to make sure that we're not actually muddying the waters and making this survey something that it shouldn't be because we don't know how to write survey questions? Um, well, I think the, the, the number one thing we approach this as is if, if a parent, well, actually, it may even be more instructive if, if you were grandma and grandpa raising your grandkids um, and, and you had stepped into a school for 40 years, if I, know the, if I know what the question is asking me to do in a very clear and concise format that I don't have to guess at what you're saying, then it's probably a well-worded question. Uh, but you're right. Uh, Double-barreled questions are, are a big no-no in our world. Um, or asking leading questions that says something like, um, oh, like, for instance, um, you know, the, the district has really improved our, our, you know, grades and now we're getting an A from the state. How do you feel we're doing? <laughs> you know, something like that, you know, like that. <laughs> it, it, it's just not very, very good data that way. But um, generally, one way we like to approach this is, especially in a survey this way, um, you will look more credible if you don't try to approach it with too much sheen. In other words, let me give you an example from a district that was a, a suburban Milwaukee district that we just worked with. And they are in maybe the top 10 of, of the 426 school districts in Wisconsin. I think they're just number eight based on our last report cards. Um, but they don't have everything right. Um, there were a couple of metrics of that report card that they wanted to improve on. And so it said, we are looking to do this survey because yes, we are rated highly, um, but we're not doing everything right. Here are some things that are really going well and here are some things that are not going well. And I think that prevented them from driving some of those leading questions because it said, we'll never be satisfied until every student is reaching their fullest potential. Um, so I think even the ordering of the questions that way can help out a lot too. Um, we'll definitely steer you into a different direction if we feel like you know you already you already know the answer. Um, and one thing you'll probably hear us say is, um, if you don't want to hear an answer to a question, don't ask it. Um, or if you already know the answer, um, then then maybe not that may not be the world's best survey question. Mrs. Munson. Yes, um, I was one of the ones who was talking to you last year, mm -hmm. and um, thank you very much for coming back. Sure. Are you able to show an example of then, like what we could release to the public after a survey? Like, is there an example of, you know, some graphs yeah. or something that would kind of show us that? Yeah. Um. Going up and a report that I think we just finished earlier this week in suburban Chicago. Oh, let's see. Um, While you're doing that, I'll just yep. try to go from my memory. I think when you were talking about the the data and how it wouldn't give the answer if you thought it was going to get too confidential, that it was kind of like if there were three respondents or less, then it would stop right. giving you, was, is that the, am I remembering the right thing? 100% correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm going to pull up two for you here and drag them over to my side of the screen. So this first one here with a little bit of the purple, this is a suburban Chicago school district. Um, so they were looking at Hickory Point Elementary. Um, their particular school climate um, was one page of their survey. Um, so here are some of those questions. So for instance, I feel welcome in my child's school. 88% um, um, agreed with that uh, question out of a 4.27 scale. So I think uh, this was a Likert scale here, one to five. So couldn't go below one, couldn't go above five. And that put them at the at the a comparison percentile of seventy five percent. So just as a reminder, uh, a percentile. Um, if you're at the fiftieth percentile, you're exactly in the middle. Uh, so by definition, fifty percent of districts are doing better than me. Fifty percent of districts are doing worse. 
Um, a comparison is something that we do do as a separate report, even though it's embedded here. Um, so if, if you wanted to know how you were stacking up against other districts that look like you, um, we would, uh, that would be something that you'd uh, purchase. And I do think though, it's really valuable. Um, so for instance, um, if it, just a quick anecdote, I remember sitting for an exam when I was in grad school and I left, um, the, the screen popped up and said I had a 94% on this particular exam and, you know, left with my chest pretty puffed you know, felt pretty good about myself only to get something in the mail a couple of weeks later that said almost everybody else got a 98%. Do I feel good about myself? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, sure, you know, I did really well on the exam, but relative to everybody else, you know, the the, the, the chest kind of deflated a little bit. And, and so that's where I think the, the comparison percentile really helps out because it contextualizes the data. So right here, for instance, uh, my child feels safe at school. By the way, this was a parent survey here. 97% uh, of parents said, yeah, they, my child feels safe at school, but that put them at the 86th percentile. So there was a little room there. If I just looked at 97%, you know, I might think, wow, that's the best that anybody could do. Whereas, you know, the 86th percentile helped kind of put that data into context. Now, that being said, if I was looking at this report, I don't think that would be my, my number one thing to tackle next because it already is going well. But I think that adding in that particular data point helps me figure out how I am doing against other schools. One I just happened to present this morning and we'll be um, virtually in Minnesota in just a couple of minutes here. Uh, they had a strategic planning survey um, and they included their non-parents, non-staff or their, or their broader community as well. Um, and one thing here in their strategic planning session is uh, section is what we said, okay, so at the end of the day, based on these three groups, where are we really hearing that people want us to put our efforts? Where are they agreeing with us the most? Um, and they had a lot of overlap. So for instance, maintaining a safe and secure campus is, was the, the number one rated answer for staff, parents, and non-parents, non-staff. And I think that at the end of the day, this is really what, what would be helpful for you to know is, okay, summarize this for me. You know, I, I, we have a lot of decisions to make as a school board. Um, where are people telling us we're doing really well? And where are people telling us that we need to, to put in some more resources and, and attention? And that's where this was as well. So the red here, this is where they had the lowest scores. And so this particular district, they were hearing from their community that they really have some work to do in their infrastructure and their facilities, um, some improvement for communications in terms of transparency and overall, are they heading in the right direction? And I think that really is what summarizes this for you because at the end of the day, you can slice and dice this data to your heart's content, um, but that's not always the most helpful because that can be, get you down a rabbit hole and that process never ends. I think our value is we can help you as a, as a, as a third party say, based on our interpretation, here is what we're seeing your community telling you to, to focus over the next two, five, 10 years, whatever that window may be. Can, can you just talk a little bit about the comparison school districts? Like how many school districts in Pennsylvania do you have? Have you, and, and similar to ONJ, um, are you brought around here? Like where, where's the, where's the heart of your um, business? So the heart of our business is in the Midwest, which I would define a lot of Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana. Um, we actually have had a few more districts reach out in Pennsylvania. Um, as, like I mentioned, a couple of the CIUs as well. But regardless, our um, our comparison pool is built nationwide. Um, and so I think I just happened to take a peek at uh, Owen J. Roberts. And I think the comparison pool that you would pull from was somewhere between about 200 and 250 schools. But that was not Pennsylvania specific. This question is probably for our administrative team. Do we have an ability to survey the greater community, not just students and? At, at this point, no. This, this survey would be for parents, it would be for students, and it would be for staff. You know, we've had those discussions. We're doing that communications audit. Mm -hmm. And we're still, I'm anxious to see when we get the results of that, because that's always been a concern. How do we get the greater community? that are, They're not in our Skyward system. Right. Um, so, but this would not be geared toward them. Could it possibly in the future, if we, with this communication plan, provides us information? Sure, we could look at that. And I also had conversations with them about postgraduate surveys, because that's something that we, we talk about a lot when kids graduate, and so that's something we could look to do in the future as well. Uh, Rob, I know you're on a, a limited time frame here, because I know you have another meeting. Are, are there any other questions for Rob before we move on? All right. Thanks for tuning in, Rob. Appreciate it. All right. Take care of yourselves. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So we'll move on to the uh, Curriculum and Special Education Committee. April, all yours.
Um, the Curriculum and Special Education Committee consists uh, as the chair of April Sabo and the co-chair of um, Kathy, um, sorry, <laughs> Kathy T. Marino <laughs> and uh, Lydia Sutzman and uh, Rita Peterson. Um, tonight we're going to talk about uh, the presentation of the I Wish program. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Soder. Great. Thank you so much. And we have several visitors here tonight who are going to talk a little bit about this program. Uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, have several of our high school students be paired with another school in Ireland. And I think that um, Ms. Mary Rita Bonner and Dr. Lehman are going to introduce these students and tell you a little bit about that program. Oh, the students are doing that. Um, Good. There we go. Hello, my name is Eliana Crew, and I'm an 11th grade student here at ONJ Roberts. I'm here to talk about OJR's involvement in the 2022 I Wish Twinning program. I was one of 12 students involved, including Hannah Wiley, Victoria Blancarte, Jazz Campbell, Kirsten Efries, Maya Evans, Sarah Ewing, Riley Herring, Sydney Smith, John C. Thadassetti, Ava Bernheimer, and Malia Whitlinger. Some of these students are also here tonight. Ms. Bonner, who is here tonight, oversaw our group, and Tracy Oberholzer, who is also here, and Patty Van Cleef from Chester County originally connected OJR with the program. In November of 2021, the CCEDC contacted us to invite us to participate in the I Wish Twinning program from Cork, Ireland to promote girls in STEM. The original proposal was to have four sets of twins create a project and have one winner share their project during the international I Wish event in February. Each of these twins would be made up of a school from the United States and a school from Ireland. During Thanksgiving week, OJR had our, our introductory meeting with the I Wish organization and our partner school, Loretto Community School, Milford and Donegal, Ireland, through Zoom. Over the next several weeks, our school met in small groups with theirs in order to plan and complete the project. There were three project choices, and our school decided upon a project titled The World Through Our Eyes. This project consisted of creating a video that would display the similarities and differences between how we see the world around us regarding STEM. Both of our schools took pictures of our world and uploaded them to a shared Google folder under four categories, architecture, engineering and technology, nature, and women in STEM. Then, a small group of girls, including myself from Owen J. Roberts and a small group from Loretto Milford, met with Irish poet Denise Blake to write a poem about the world through our eyes. The poem was read by students from both schools and included a voiceover, included as a voiceover in the final film. This part of the process was not only fun, but it also gave us the opportunity to collaborate closely with the students in Ireland and to learn from a well-known Irish poet. I will now let Hannah finish going through the process as she played a very important role in the large task of constructing the video itself. Hello, I'm Hannah Wiley and I'm a 12th grade student here at ONJ. Girls from Loretto Milford wrote and performed a few different music pieces. These were later included in our video as background music. OGR girls, including Riley Herring, Maya Evans, Malia Whitlinger, and myself created the final video using the picture's poem and music. Mr. Sponigle was a huge help with the film production as he let us use our, his classroom and editing technology early in the morning and late into the night. In total, we spent about 21 hours on the final video. Ultimately, only two sets of twins were able to get organized and complete the project. Due to this, I was decided that it would no longer be a competition and both groups would share their projects during the international event on February 10th. This means that OGR is one of only two schools in the U.S. to have been a part of this international event to promote girls in STEM. On the day of the event, we were able to go over to the boardroom and watch the event, and we're lucky enough to have Principal Mr. Kohler, Vice Principal Mr. Richardson, Superintendent Dr. Stout, Super Assistant Superintendent Dr. Soder, and Director of Science Dr. Lehman in attendance, as well as Lee Craig and Lisa Marciano from the CCEDC. Victoria Blancarte also represented our school in a student panel discussion shared during the I Wish event. And later, Maya Evans, Riley Herring, and Sydney Smith joined the girls from Loretto Milford for an interview on an Irish radio station. The girls were a part of Highland Radio Morning Show on February 15th. Our team has also been invited to present and share our experiences at the Chester County Get event on April 30th. The video itself is not going to be shown tonight, but the link can be accessed through the OGR homepage underneath the headlines. We would love to answer any questions you may have. Anybody have any questions for our I Wish program? 
guys, this is awesome. I, I, if you would you do it again if you had the opportunity? Awesome. So how many of all you guys were part of the? the awesome. It's really good. Um, yeah, I would, you guys. I would just add, as someone who um, was able to, to see it firsthand in the conference room that day, it, it was outstanding. So I appreciate your work. And just it just talks about our, our global society and what we're in and trying to prepare our kids for, you know, interacting with students, you know, in Ireland. And it, it's just, you know, the, the way we can, we can do projects like that now that we couldn't in the past. So thank you very much for your participation. We're very proud of you. Yeah, great, great job, guys. Thank you guys for coming out tonight, too. We really appreciate it, and it was a really great presentation. Dr. Soder will also be talking, oh no, Dr. Marchini. <laughs> uh, we'll be talking tonight about State of Homeless, uh, the review port. Thank you. Certainly not as exciting as that last presentation, but I'll do my best. Um, the McKinney Vent to Homeless uh, Monitoring Report, we do this every three years. Um, the uh, McKinney Vent to Homeless Act basically uh, provides resources uh, by law for students who are designated homeless. And in essence, the law creates a consistent educational program and um, provides services to the students regardless of how their uh, um, home or lack of home life is at that time. Um, the monitor, uh, we did it three years ago and they came in this fall, um, the state monitor. Um, it was hybrid this year, so we had to provide quite a bit of resources in advance and then a Zoom call um, as well. Um, if you go to the next slide, the uh, areas that they look at, um, basically there's a district liaison, which is me. Um, there's district staff training that goes on throughout um, our staff, making sure they understand the laws so as to easily identify students who might need our assistance. Uh, student awareness, so if students are in the school, um, especially at the upper grades, that if they find themselves in a situation, um, they're able to uh, at least ask for assistance. Um, transportation, transportation is provided for students. Uh, so if, for example, a student becomes homeless, they're in O and J Roberts School District, but have to move to a hotel in Pottstown or let's say Phoenixville. Um, they're still allowed to stay in the school district in their school and we provide transportation in many cases when it becomes a, a extreme hardship we call the other school district and work out transportation between the two, two districts um, identification of students we have uh, extensive training with our attendance folks at the schools principals etc uh, making sure that they understand that when there's a um, something occurs and that they need to look at that they can call me um, call our office and make sure they run the scenario by, by us to make sure to see if that student would qualify for these services. Timely interventions, uh, the law is very specific that it has to be automatic, can't delay whatsoever because the student's needs are paramount. Um, academic data, we're asked to track the academic data for homeless students to make sure that uh, even though they are experiencing dif difficulty, still getting all the services they need. And budget allocation, um, we don't have a very large budget for this, but our schools all have resources available for anything a student might need. So for example, uh, we just had one that uh, one student at the high school that needed driver's education, and we of course uh, paid for that so that they can still uh, keep moving forward with their, with their uh, peers. Health needs, um, physical screenings, uh, dental appointments, anything like that, make sure that they have whatever they might need. Enrollment, if a student is homeless and they show up on our doorstep, um, maybe from another district or they've moved from another state, something like that. Uh, we take that in consideration and without paperwork, we need to enroll them right away uh, if they qualify for that. Um, that way there's no displacement of education over that time. Um, of course, we keep very good records for all these things. Uh, free meals, uh, I know everybody gets free meals now, but in that case, student would automatically be eligible for free breakfast and lunch programs. And special services, especially if students are experiencing some sort of learning difficulties, making sure that all the services are available for them. And then our regional office is the Berks County IU. Uh, we use Chester County for everything, but Berks County IU is our um, office to talk to if we have any questions, resources related to homeless students. Um, and just for um, uh, qualification, we have approximately 21 homeless students currently 
And each year we go between 15 and 25. Sometimes specific events might happen. Uh, a couple of years ago we had the apartment fire, so we had a, you know, 10, 15 students the next day that were considered homeless. Some were living outside the school district, uh, but as I said, they still have the option to stay in their school of origin, um, even if they find a home after that. So for some of those students who maybe couldn't find somewhere to rent in O and J and went over to Spring Ford and found an apartment, they can still stay for the rest of the year. Um, so it guarantees the, the continuation of education for the year. Based on the homeless uh, audit, we had two findings uh, that one uh, was interesting. We have homeless posters around all the buildings, uh, but the Spanish versions were not available next to the English versions. So we asked to hang those up, which we did. Uh, one was a neat improvement was the training for staff. We've made training available um, through all of our educational staff, but the finding was that we needed to make it available for all staff, including bus drivers, cafeteria, power professionals, et cetera. You never know when someone might hear that a student's been displaced and needs assistance. So what we did was we added that to our safe schools training program, it comes out of our HR office. So things like uh, uh, mandated reporting, sexual harassment, um, workplace harassment, things like that, this was added to that. And then it records when a, when a staff member goes through that module, it records that they did it. So in the next audit, we'll, have a, uh, we'll be able to show that every single staff member received it you know, every two years as part of the uh, Safe Schools program. So that's what we did to um, uh, fix that one. Um, I just had a meeting with the Berks County IU. They go through the state program and say, did you follow through with your findings? And I was actually able to show this, this PowerPoint to them and go over it. And they're very satisfied with our progress. Any questions? Um, when we talk about um, tracking the academic day, academic progress, are we only looking at that for the time where they are displaced, or are we looking at that for some amount of time afterwards to make sure that they've recouped what they may have lost during that time? Um, we're very fortunate, OJ, that many of our students are only homeless for the duration of that year because of circumstances. And so the data they asked me to show was for this past year which I did. Um, so I guess at any given year, we look to make sure the students are um, categorized. And what we do um, automatically when a student is classified as homeless, um, we reach out to the parents, reach out to the principals, we uh, see what resources they need. We go through our whole checklist. We also check all their grades, their attendance, um, PSSA scores, what services they received. And a lot of times the parents are um, fortunately so involved in trying to find a place, a home, income, et cetera, that some of those other things fall through the cracks and we assist them um, immediately upon classification. What kind of population is, is this at o and I realize it changes year over year, but just, just kind of scale it for us. 10 kids a year, four, one, 30? Oh, I'm sorry, we have 21 currently, 15 to 25 a year. Okay. Wow. Any of those students literally have no address at all, like live in a shelter or a car or something like that? And what do we do with that, those extreme situations? Um, we don't really have many that are in shelters. What we do is when they get into the uh, Chester County system, they're often um, given stipends for hotel stays, things like that. So uh, when they're homeless, they um, could be in a hotel, motel. More often than not, they're doubled up with a friend or a family member. So, um, you know, a, a family struggling, lose their lease, move in with a parent, grandparent, something like that, and that doubled up status uh, becomes homeless as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Marchini. Our next one, uh, we have approval for our uh textbook for consideration? We do. So um, what I'm sharing with you is a advanced placement text for economics. So um, this is the recommendation the, the course did undergo a revision. And so this is the recommended text from the teaching staff for that course. And just as a reminder, all of the texts that you have seen in our working sessions this spring would be on the April board agenda for, for the full board's consideration. Uh, we would be moving those, they, they cannot come before the full board before April 1st, so they'll be on the 
uh, I, I want to say it's the third week in, in April, it'll be on that agenda for all of the ones that we have seen in January, February, and now March. I know we've talked about this before, but I just cannot recall. Um, this, this for an AP course, how many texts really are they looking at? Like, how many choices are there for AP classes? It, it will really vary by the, it, it will vary by the subject. So some AP courses, they may be given three to five titles. Um, so they always have some choices. Okay. So this one is specific to AP. Not all of the texts that we have for our AP courses are, have that in the title, but this one does. And I should share just because, um, you know, our enrollment and, and the projections are still in flux right now. We wouldn't order the text unless the class was running, but I'm still interested in getting the text approved. Any questions from the committee? Any questions from the board? Okay, we can move on. We'll need oh, a motion sorry. for that one. Uh, can I uh, make a motion to move the uh, textbook forward? So moved. Second. Yeah. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, we need somebody from the committee. Oh, from the committee. Um, Rita. We only have Rita. <laughs> you, I can. You we, can I can second. Can I second? Okay. I second it. That's all we have for curriculum tonight. All right, uh, school start time committee. So this is an open discussion with the board and Dr. Stoughton administration, obviously. So just to, for everybody's background, the last board of directors, we actually formed an ad hoc committee to look at school start time as some schools in the area were starting to do this in the Pennsylvania, um, uh, the State Department of Education was actually talking about this as a potential issue as well. So um, we had formed the ad hoc committee. Uh, John Deal at the time was uh, put in charge of it and then COVID hit. So then everything was put on hold. So uh, this discussion is we have this committee out here. We need to um, decide as a board to kind of move it back forward, select a new uh, chairperson for this committee. And just as a Further background, because it's an ad hoc committee, and one of the ways we discussed it in the last board was it'd be open to not just board members, but uh, community members as well. So it'd be driven as um, a community board, as school board members and staff on, on this uh, this uh, school start time committee to, to review it. And the, the general idea is um, the science said it, it's an hour different, you know, recommended 8.30 start time at a minimum, which would be an hour difference. This is if we started from that assumption, what, what would that take and what would be the impact to J. Roberts? And do we or do we not want to pursue this? So we decided and we wanted to put it on a rigid timeline of let's do the analysis, let's do the work and then decide one way or another and, and do that. So with that, I'm just going to open up for board discussion on this and if I know Ms. DiMarino, you had uh, a lot of work on this committee as well. If you want to chime in, yeah, I, I will. I will refrain from giving an hour talk on this topic, but I could, because um, I know it's 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 controversial. But we know that just um, you know, it's teenagers. This is something that they need, and we also know that Dr. Stout has experience with it. So that's exciting for us because he can give us some information that we may not have had before. Um, I do think that um, we've shown that COVID basically has shown us that people are a lot more flexible than we ever knew and have made a lot of different choices um, in their lives. So, and I think that, um, you know, especially with the mental health issues that are going on with teenagers, that we should try to take away any barrier, you know, that they may have for good mental health and get not getting enough sleep is a real problem. Most teenagers cannot fall asleep before 11 o'clock or so, and they're, you know, if you have a bus that comes at 620, like we do, um, you really are up far, you just really cannot get enough rest in that time. So I would definitely think that we should um, continue looking at this. Um, do like Mr. Friel said, do the work, find, make a recommendation, and then we vote on it, and that's the end of it, because I know everyone is weary of talking about it, even me. 
Um, I agree with Mrs. DiMarino. I think, you know, as she said, what COVID has shown us is that we are capable of um, making immense strides and, and creating uh, meaningful change when we need to. And I think that um, I was one of those community members who said, just make a decision, let's move on, um, because I didn't want to talk about it anymore. And um, I think I was quite vocal about that over the years. Uh, and I think that we, we have an opportunity now to um, have a discussion on this. If we're going to move forward, find a great solution on how we can do that and make the right steps to move forward. Um, and if we're not, that we, we put a pin in and we move on as a community. But I think having a committee formed at this time um, to you know, give it really our best shot at finding the right solution and moving toward that solution is the best thing to do. I do have something else to say about it, but um, you know, we look further on the agenda. We have like you know, traffic studies and all these things coming, and um, you know, I do think that uh, it's important for us all to recognize that um, we are parents are already making a lot of choices to try to not get their kids on the bus at six twenty, six thirty in the morning. And we have traffic all over the campus because so many people are dropping off. Oh, my kid just needs that extra 15 minutes or whatever. Um, we could be solving a lot more problems than we even realize if we were to do this. Um, I think that families would be shocked at how much, you know, it would affect their child in, in a positive way. Anybody have any questions from the board about formation of the committee or what next steps are? Um, well, you said that um, we should have a chair. Do we need to accept nominations for the chair? So, so yeah, we would. I, th I think what we would do now is, if uh, anybody would like to volunteer, Miss Dean Marino, to be the chair, uh, we'll consider <laughs> that. that. Sure. <laughs> uh, but, but in all seriousness, uh, yeah. So, what we do, we'd we'd select a new chair um because i feel john deal from hilton head probably won't take it <laughs> probably turn us down um but yeah so we, we'd form the committee and then the committee can get to work doing it um but but i just wanted to bring it back for the even though the we technically already formed it um i feel felt it was you know we needed to discuss it in the committee because we have four new board members here and wanted to bring it back up readdress the issue uh, put it on the table and then you know we'll move forward with it at the next board meeting yeah. Can you remind me again, is, is there public input on this committee or can public members of on this committee? And yes. Then, or how are they recruited or are they, they volunteer? We're going to put the word out for people to join the committee. Yeah, I, I think a little both is it's, it's going to be looking for volunteers and looking for our principals to try to get a representation across the, the committee. The way we discussed it at the last board was we wanted to make sure we had ample representation across the district, you know, not just not just self-selected but also try to recruit so we had you know representation from kind of all walks of life mm -hmm. and all circumstances so that you know we're, we're when we're looking at the impact of families we have perspectives on here that represent all the types of families that would represent I mean, at least that was the idea beforehand and i think we're going to need our admin teams at the the great all, all the buildings to help us recruit those folks in and then you know and, and the broader community volunteer obviously and then uh you know, I think we've had success when we did the uh, strategic planning of getting a lot of input in. And then there's probably, you know, be the steering committee and then some subcommittees on stuff, it, like, depending on how it evolves and how it gets. But I'll leave that to the committee itself to decide its own kind of fate and structure in that sense. Does the committee have to be um, less than a quorum? Like, can we only have four members of the board on the committee if, mm. as an ad hoc committee? I don't think so. If we're meeting a public and we're and we're doing that, it, I think that only we trip over that is if there was like, for some reason, we're doing something that would revolve a vote and we weren't doing it in public. But we can double check that. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to check on that because I know okay. we did comprehensive planning. We invited all board members to be there. Okay. Uh, but this is an ad hoc, so we're going to have to do. We'll have to do some checking. I think so. As I think as long as we're not deliberating or making any decisions, we'll be fine. But like Dr. Stout said, we can check. Yeah, just double check. I think just steering away from that whole public deliber deliberation that's not public would be the right. trip. I right. Was just, the, what came to my mind was that obviously this committee could be making decisions about how, like, how many people from each school would we like to, you know, those, those are some decisions just in the formation of the committee outside board members that would have to be made. So 
Um, is that or the, would those be voting voting items? I know? don't think so. I think that's sort of committee. We could just leave that as committee work, you know, in terms of how big and and okay. what it gets done, and you know, just the board can when we authorize a committee, you know, we could just reaffirm and just the committee's empowered to do that, you know, that way. Okay. We're out then. Sounds good. Cool. What else? All right, so. Or we could just go, all those in favor of 8.30 start time? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right. Um, so I think the next step is, is that we'll just uh, appoint the chair of the committee, um, Mrs. D. Marino, and uh, get you to work. Someone else might want this job. <laughs> just, just wondering. Just making recommendations, that's all. <laughs> Right. I, I would support Mrs. De Marino because I think she's worked the longest and hardest of the current board members on this already. She's got a lot of knowledge behind her. We'll dig it out. Yeah. All those in favor, take a step back. Now, I think I think it'll be good. And you know, we're all here to help, and we'll form this committee. I think it'll be a broader community committee. So, it, which is, you know, I think it's the right model for something like this. Um, and just for the public's comment, we're going to put this on a deliberate path and a deliberate timeline. So um, there'll be some milestones and check-ins that we're just going to either, like as everybody said, we're going to make a decision and, and that'll be the end of this. Um, it either going for it or it, it dies. And I'll just add it, this is not being considered for the 2022-2023 school year. <laughs> so if we were to do this, there would be committee work and we would be doing it through the, uh, through the fall. And if we make that recommendation and the board approves it, uh, there would be ample time uh, for, for folks to prepare. Very good point, Dr. Stout. <laughs> yes. All right. So we, we're good to move on. We'll go to listening session update. All right, good. Listening sessions then. Um, stop. Mr. Sanfran, if you could pull up the, the presentation. So um, just want to go through some information here from the listening sessions and just a little ad lib before we get into the PowerPoint. Um, just found these to be extremely valuable as a first year superintendent uh, to come in and, and have the opportunity to, to meet with folks in the community at the different schools. Um, just as an, as an overview, uh, we had oh, 16 of these meetings, I believe. Um, we, did, uh, we did them in person, and we also did them virtually in each one of our schools. We also did one uh, virtually for our uh, virtual academy, and then we offered one for the, the general community at large. So, Paul, that's, do you want to go to the PowerPoint? Could you pull the PowerPoint up for me? There we go. And you just move to the next slide. Sorry, right. I can just talk through it as well. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I mentioned we had 16. Now, again, as a new superintendent, it was very helpful to have those listening sessions, but it was also very timely as well uh, because we're working on our comprehensive plan uh, that we'll be bringing to the board uh, later this school year. But that comprehensive plan is our, I'll say it's our pathway for the next three to six years. So we were um, purposeful in having those listening sessions so that we could take information from those listening sessions and incorporate them into our comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. So when we were going through this process, just to give folks an idea as to, as to what we did that evening, or those evenings when we had those listening sessions, um, I was there with the rest of my cabinet team, and we did a brief overview of our district goals. So they're here. I'm not going to spend time on these uh, because we've talked about these uh, a lot since the fall. But as a team, we reviewed the goals with the folks that were in, that were in attendance. Paul, if you go next slide, please. 
And then we ask the following five open-ended questions. And we ask these questions in each and every school. We ask the same questions when we did the general community. We just changed the wording a little bit differently because it wasn't geared toward parents. So, but they were the same overall questions. So you can see what the questions were. What are your greatest hopes for students in the Owen J. Roberts School District? What are your greatest fears for students in our district? Does your student feel like they belong and are accepted in our schools? Are there barriers students are experiencing in the district? And then what are the key needs and priorities for our school district moving forward? So again, putting those questions out there, we were able to get a lot of information and a lot of feedback from folks. So Paul, next slide, please. So what we did, and again, you can imagine 16 meetings, hearing from different stakeholders and gathering information. We gathered all that information in the aggregate. So we had a report that probably had 30 to 40 pages of just information that we were receiving. Um, we had Ashley Boyd, who works with us in communications, just taking notes the entire time so that we could capture all the information. So after we finished these, these uh, meetings, we were able to take a look at all that information and really narrow it down to nine themes that we were able to uncover uh, from, from these listening sessions. Now, the one thing I was pleased to see when I saw these themes is they look very similar to our goals and things that we're looking at for comprehensive planning. So there wasn't anything on here that really stood out. So for me, it was affirmation that some of the work that we're doing is, right in, the direct, is in the right direction. So, but just a quick overview of these nine themes that we saw that emerged uh, from these listening sessions. The first one, provide a well-rounded education that will prepare students for the future. Well, you know, if you look at the mission and vision of a school district, that's really what we're here to do. Uh, we do a lot of services for kids, but in the end, you know, we want to prepare kids for what lies next to the, for them. And that can be academically, that can be career-wise, can be the military. But whatever they're interested in doing, we want to be able to prepare them. The second theme provides support and resources for mental health and, and social, social emotional health. You know, we've had a lot of discussions around that, particularly during the pandemic. But I will argue even prior to the pandemic, uh, student mental health needs was, was a very big concern for school districts. And we saw it. It was just exacerbated throughout the pandemic. So um, we provide a number of services, and we're going to continue to do that moving forward. Promote competitive academics. You know, there was a, a common theme at a lot of our meetings. You know, O&J is a highly ranked school district, and, you know, our community and folks in, in and our community want to keep it that way. So we need to continue to offer quality programs and competitive academics uh, so that we remain a desirable school district. Uh, open and honest communication, visibility, and transparency. Um, that is something that I found no matter what school district you're in. You know, folks want uh, the district, the board, our staff to be open and honest uh, with our communications, be visible and be transparent. And that's that will continue to be one of our one of our goals moving forward, that's part of our goals for this year, and we're in the middle of the communication audit right now to look at how we can do that better. Create a positive environment and school culture of respect and belonging. You know, that really is, is around the social emotional learning. You know, if kids feel that they belong, uh, then they're going to do better in school. And that, that goes down with staff as well. That goes to parents, you know, when parents come into our buildings. Uh, they need to feel like, like they're a partner and that we welcome them in our, in our buildings. Uh, establish heightened safety and discipline, uh, discipline measures for staff and students. This came up in a lot of our discussions. You know, people were concerned about, about safety in our buildings. Um, we, we do a lot. I mean, we have our own school security, uh, our own school police force, which many school districts do not have. I think most people know that's part of our geography too. You know, if we would have to rely on the state police for a timely response, uh, that we probably would not get it. They have a long, a lot of area to cover, but we're very lucky in this district that we have our own police force that can respond um, very quickly on campus. And I will preface that also by saying our state police respond very quickly when when we call on them. But sometimes they are, you know, on the outskirts. So it's nice to have our own police force on campus. And I will also say, you know, our other schools, our elementary schools, are serviced by the local police departments as well. And early on, I met with all those police chiefs and with the principals together, and we're very fortunate. We have a tremendous relationship and collaboration and cooperation with the local police departments 
that service our elementary schools. Uh, seven here is promote equity, diversity, and accessibility for all, uh, which is, is one of our, our goals as well. Uh, unify, number eight, unify staff, students, parents, and community, and build district pride and morale. You know, for being candid, you know, the last two years with the pandemic has brought a lot of division, not just in the, in the country, but also locally as well. So I know in my role, that's something that, that I'm very cognizant of and I'm very determined to, to reach out to folks and try, and try and mend some of those barriers or some of those divisions, because when it's all said and done, we're one community. And I think we need to, to come together as a community to do the best that we can for our kids. And then the last one, um, and this is important, one of our goals as well, demonstrate responsibility through finances and resources. You know, one thing about ONJ, and I'm going to say this publicly, we'll mention it later, um, Jackie Crumrine, I was just at a, a PSBA or PASBO uh, conference last week, and Jackie was essentially received the, the business uh, manager for school districts for the entire state of the a year award. And I knew coming in that I had the best business manager around, and that was just confirmed last week. Um, but that said, um, we need to be very respectful um, you know, of our community and how we're spending money. We are a unique school district in that we don't have a lot of business and industry uh, in our school district. So a lot of the lion's share of the responsibility falls on our taxpayers. And we don't ever forget that. And that is cognizant or in our, in our background when we're making decisions. So that is important that we continue to be um, fiscally responsible with our finances as we move forward. So Mr. Sanfran, next slide. You know, the next steps, you know, the board and administration will review these themes from the listening sessions and take them into consideration when we're doing our comprehensive planning and also when we develop our goals in the future. As I said at the beginning of this presentation, I was very pleased to see that these themes that emerged were aligned with our goals. But as we develop our goals in the future, we will continue to look at these themes and have them help guide us. So that is the information I have around the listening sessions. Are there any questions for me? Any questions? So I would say just, um, you know, give us a sense of, uh, you know, as we incorporate this feedback and the strategic planning, what's just for public and board consumption timing of when that next presentation and next step is? Um, to go over that and, and how we're going to. Sure. Um, I believe our, our, next, our next step is at the next board meeting in April, the next board working session, we will be bringing the comprehensive plan uh, forward for the board to consider. So if you recall, most of the board members know, but for public consumption, we did contract with the Chester County Intermediate Unit, uh, and they helped facilitate uh, those sessions. So we're in the process of, of getting that final report from them. Um, and then I've been working with Dr. Soder uh, to take that report from the Chester County Intermediate Unit, which I think is very user friendly. And then we have to take that information and we have to put it into the state form, which is not as user friendly. So as we move forward, our comprehensive plan is going to be based off of the report that I think is, is um, I think our community will find very useful as we move forward. Awesome. Any other questions before we move on? But the, will that comprehensive plan, will, will we be able to see links between that comprehensive plan and these specific session themes or goals? I think it's not in the report, but I think what you're going to see is a lot of overlap with what we have here. But how I, how I view these themes is we want to consider that for the comprehensive planning, but also each year as a board, we need to create our goals. And I think and I know that we'll continue to refer to these as we're creating our board goals as well, along with our comprehensive plan. When we create those goals, I think the goal setting is great, but it would be nice at the end of the year to say, hey, this is, how, this is what we did for number four here or whatever, and these are the different successes we had or the different things we did, because I, I fail sometimes to see all of these things connect, you know? Sure. And, and this year, we, we went through a different process with our, with our goals. So I think they're, they're much clearer. So when we present them in the springtime, uh, we'll have some, some data. And, and there's, like anything else, we'll be open and honest with it. There are some goals that we're going to meet. There are others that we aren't. 
but I think that we have some, some, some better benchmarks that we've had in the past and some better data points that we can measure to see whether or not we're reaching those goals. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an important point is just having the data there that supports all this stuff. And, you know, as we talk about the surveys too, to the to the impact of this kind of line aligns well with that earlier first presentation of, you know, this is, you know, merging themes point in time, we're going to address them. And then how are we doing against that? Right? Because, you know, this is like a point in time perception. We want to make progress. We want to. We want to feel like, and the community feel like. You know, communication's been a multiple year theme of like, hey, we can, and I'm sure every school district gets the same thing. But but how do we measure it? Like, what are those things? And 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 feeding that back into that survey. So I, I really like that we have that. And it's just, I think it's just a matter of making sure we align our goals, our survey, our information here, our strategic plan. So if if folks look at all of them, you can see across, you know, through that whole group of things that there's, there's themes in alignment between those things um, and that we're measuring those things that are, that are meaningful to measure. So um, this is good information. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board discussion or questions on the listening sessions? All right. Um, staffing recommendations. We're recommending we staff the school next year. Um, all right. All right. I don't know who's that going to be. Cat. Okay, Dr. Soder. Hi. Thank you so much. So uh, earlier in the fall, the board approved projected enrollment for all of our schools. And that enrollment is what Mrs. Crumrine uses when she is preparing the budget and when she is putting together the staffing recommendation. And so this is a team effort where um, I more or less take care of the bodies and um, Mrs. Crumrine takes care of the finances. So I'm going to um, walk you through a document uh, that, that you have in front of you about the projected enrollment, or excuse me, the projected staffing, and then um, Mrs. Crumrine will follow up with the, the financial impact. So um, I don't know. Nope. All right, so our, our board can actually see this one. Perfect, thanks so much. And you can go right to the next slide. So this first page is the summary for the elementary schools. And as we see every year, we have um, changes in our the number of sections in each of the buildings and if you if you've been around our school district for some time you know that we have our own vocabulary for this we talk about hot spots and cold spots places where the grade level enrollment is maybe just getting very close to the top of the class size regulation that's a hot spot places where the enrollment is perhaps just below the class size regulation that's a cold spot and so actually, after the school board approves the staffing, this becomes a weekly task for us to take a look at the incoming registrations and really just check that to make sure that our staffing is going to be appropriate for the coming year. So this first slide has the summary for the five elementary schools. And so we do have an increased enrollment at our secondary level and a decreased enrollment at our elementary level. It's like so perfect because it's right here up at the right here up at the um, top. The classroom teachers you can see that our current classroom teacher number is 120, and that we're down 3.5 for next year. However, we have added five STEAM positions, five STEM positions. You may recall that we talked about doing this in January that we were going to be adding that special area for next year, and at that time we talked about having three. And if we could fund it, we would be looking at five. So in conversations with, with Mrs. Crumrine and with Dr. Stout, we are confident in making that change this year so that next year we would begin the year with five. So what that does for us is bring us to adding 1.5 staff members for our elementary staffing with all the pluses and minuses for places that we would be adding as well as subtracting because of enrollment. If we move on to the next slide, 
you're going to see our middle school staffing projections. And so we're a little more stable here. We have added in our world language, it's actually staffing to what we are currently doing in that, in that building. We have an additional guidance counselor. Remember that we've had increased enrollment in our middle school and our high school, and this was a request actually prior to the pandemic. We also have a, a, a portion of an additional athletic trainer that's in the staffing. So it brings our staffing increase from middle school to 2.55. You know, it seems a little odd to have that kind of part-time, but it's, it's shared among the building. So there is an increase in middle school at 2.55. And then lastly, our high school staffing. Again, some increases and decreases among the various departments um, having to do with the number of students who have registered for, for specific courses, um, as well as I want to say um, a shift in some of our special areas and in gifted. So we do have a, a straight increase in special education based on case numbers and so we are looking at an increase of 1.0 specifically in our special education teachers so it makes our total increase for the high school at 1.45 and then that last slide has elementary middle and high school where you can see the full summary so you're seeing that increase of 1.5 for the elementary the increase of 2.55 for the middle school, the increase of 1.45 at the high school, which gives us a grand total for our instructional staff at 5.5 district wide. Questions? Um, if you add up all, uh, obviously these schools have different enrollment flux, you know, if we add up the whole district and do we have enrollment increase as a whole to, you know, like we have 5.5 .5 more teachers coming in. Do we actually have increased enrollment if you add it all together? Or in, how does that work out? So in the, in the total enrollment in our secondary, yes. So uh, district-wide, I want to say we do, right? Right, we do. Um, I want to say somewhere around 40. Uh, but keep in mind, the five STEAM positions aren't related to any enrollment. Right, right. right. Yeah. So you really would. Right. Um, or guiding about 0.5 increase yeah. overall if you take the five steam positions out of there yeah mm -hmm. that makes okay. sense yeah so we're relative. um also if you go back to that with well, that elementary slide um i saw you know we obviously have grants that fund the title one and um but i i never noticed the one about um the academic coach we have one grant funded and one district funded i just wonder mm -hmm. if you could tell us why that is sure so we have we have one in each building it's that dollar amount that is shared among all five buildings. So it's the equivalent of one, but it is shared among that, that those dollars are shared among all five schools. So it's Title IIa yeah. funding that, okay. that, that we're talking about. And so the dollar amount of that is the equivalent about of one staff member, but we do have five. Okay. Okay. So you have one that's one that's grant funded and one that and four that are district funded. Could you just talk about the the special education development? I know um, just just how is that? How do you decide what needs of each school um, get the special education? How well aligned with that is that to the number of IEPs and number of stuff? Like how, how does how does you know how would we look at that staffing and then align it to the the student population. Sure, and um, I'm, I'm gonna do my best, Dr. Marchini, but if you feel that you wanna add anything, come, come right on up. So it really does depend on the individual program that the student is enrolled in. So there are case level limits depending on the program that the student has, and that's based on, on the information in the student's IEP. So this increase that you're seeing at the high school is specific to the number of students who are enrolled in the high school, the number of students who are permitted in each of those programs, and the case level requirements for the teachers who are assigned. We're at a point now where we need to add to our, to our overall staffing for specifically for the high school. 
And I might add that PDE really establishes those ah. caseload requirements, just to be clear. So with the staffing numbers, so do the principals kind of come to you guys and ask, ask like what their needs are or are there other metrics in the decision or, sorry, do the principals come to you guys with what needs are or are there other metrics that go into the decisions? So this is a combination. So indeed the principals will come forward with specific requests for, for their building. In the case of, of special education, those, the, the metrics are going to come from a, a wide variety. So we have special education supervisors who are monitoring the case numbers for, for the staff. They're also taking a look at the incoming students, the needs, and what's listed that the student may need in their IEP, what programs they're going to be enrolled in. That's going to, that, that's going to influence staffing as well. And, and for example, like the guidance counselor, not part of special education, but this was a request just based on the need, the current needs of the middle school students prior to the pandemic and, and what we are hoping to move forward for that building, given the size of that building. So it, it's, a, it's a wide variety that come forward when it mm -hmm. comes to staffing. Right, and we're absolutely also following our class size regulations when we're calculating, for example, enrollment, elementary class size, and teachers. So the class size comes from the regulation, and then we're using that to inform how many teachers we need based on the population and the classes that we're offering. Um, so the other question I have is, so I was looking at the future index's demographic breakdown, and maybe that's not the best metric to use or whatnot for the demographics. So if there's another one, please let me know. But I, when I was looking at the different breakdowns <laughs> through the elementary schools, the number of socioeconomic disadvantaged populations and the special educations, based on what our, our numbers are um, for staffing, they just didn't quite equal. Um, like some of our, we had less staffing in some areas, but those were our higher special education and socioeconomic disadvantaged populations. Okay, so we might have more staff in one elementary, special education staff in one elementary building because we have a program that is housed there. So globally, we have, for example, uh, an emotional support program at East Coventry. So there are more special education teachers assigned to East Coventry, for example, compared to North Coventry because they don't have that specific program. So we have specific programs at North Coventry, at French Creek, and at West Vincent, which does have more special education teachers in those three schools compared with North Coventry or East Vincent. We also have um, a Title I comparison summary that is done by our compliance officer each year, and that would be information that would take into account students who are accessing Title I services and making sure that the student to staff ratio in those schools, so that would specifically be North Coventry, East Coventry, and East Vincent, that they do not have that, a higher ratio compared with the non-title schools, West Vincent and French Creek. Right, and I think it's also important to point out when you're looking at the supports, like if you look at the elementary schools, just as an example, there are different levels of support that are provided in all of the buildings to help support all of those services too. No, well, that's true. The mm -hmm. summary doesn't really have the blueprint of, right. of the staffing the way that the detail report will. So, you, you know, if you've seen that before, you've seen the clams, the lambs, you know, right. all, all of those different positions that are common to each of our elementary schools, and then you have additional supports for Title I services, you have additional supports for specific special education programming. Good point. I, have a, I think you have a summary for, oh. I have a question um, regarding cyber teachers. Um, I know this year we have a number of, I guess they would be core classroom teachers, but they're dedicated to a cyber class. So uh, what is the expectation for next year around that? So right now, all of our, our cyber programming is ESSERS funded. So even those teachers who are contracted and who have a cyber class, if, if you want to say it, like they're backfilled with a long-term substitute at the elementary level. So if we move forward with that, if we don't move forward with that, those positions are, are long-term substitutes this year. 
all of the contracted positions are intact in our staffing yeah. if that's if that helps so so the staffing numbers may represent a smaller number of long-term substitutes it, but no. the number of full-time this are, is yeah our our staffing what you are looking at are the contracted only so we don't have long-term substitutes in this staffing document it is our contracted teachers only and all of those contracted teachers are represented in these numbers because we're taking our whole student population when we're projecting staffing so Regardless the essers actually program. right we do we will we'll need to provide you know instruction for all of our students whether it's cyber or regular education so this year as dr soder explained if we pulled a contracted teacher out to help with cyber, they were backfilled with a long term substitute, which is not in this staffing because it's not a long term commitment. Mm -hmm. And all of the students who are in the, the cyber classes are represented in the staffing document. They are part of the numbers for each of those schools. But because of the way that we've allowed them to self select, I think sometimes we may need an additional teacher just to cover that differentiation because we need more classes because a certain number of students chose to go cyber so for next year if we have that same situation would we still need to staff long-term substitutes without the essers funding we are working through that and dr south please yeah we're, we're still that. having conversations uh, Mrs. Munson, we have not de determined what our virtual program is going to look like next year. I mean, our, our enrollments in virtual are going down tremendously uh, now that we're at this stage of the pandemic. A number of kids are coming back into our in-person. So we're having conversations right now. Um, we, ha we have a, a team with, uh, with teachers and with our administration that are looking at our virtual options moving forward. Thank you. When are those ESSERGE funds done? When's that? Mm, I will be talking about that soon, but the cliff for Essers is really 2023-24. So, so we got at most one more academic year to figure Correct. this out. Um, but, but also like having this big cyber up in the air right now is a challenge to, mm -hmm. to, to manage, right? So it, it is a challenge to execute on and a challenge, I think, for parents, community members, and everybody to not know what those options are. So I, I think, um, but, I, but if I understand the budgeting process for staff, we're budgeting like every kid's in school, all the teachers are in school, and, and, that's, and that, that's how we budget um, and staff. And then if in fact we split it out, it doesn't impact the total number of bodies, it just means some will be cyber, some won't be, and the, and the backfill is the long-term substitutes that we fund through ESSERS. As right. we did this year. Right. Yeah, which is the same thing we did this year. So it's zero impact to staffing. It's just a matter of, in a practical sense, it, it doesn't impact these numbers. Okay. Right. Just, just so everybody's clear on that. But we do need to figure out cyber quickly. Uh, Mr. Field, do you want me to review any of the numbers that are associated? Or do you want to move on to the budget? As far as uh, staffing, staffing proposals. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you, do you have something to present? Present away. Sure. Sorry. Didn't mean to There's, jump in. I just want to make sure that the board is aware that we've assigned costs to all of the proposals. They are included in the preliminary budget that you're going to hear. And there's also a document in board docs for you to review. Okay. And if you have any questions, I'm happy. I'm happy to answer those questions. We'll have questions. I know. <laughs> All right. Any other uh, board questions for staffing and budget? All right. Uh, let's move on to finance, building, and grounds. You, you're not hearing us back here? OK. All right. Try to get in here. All right. So we're moving on to finance, buildings, and grounds with that. Uh, OK. Can everybody Tom? hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, we've got six things here on the agenda. Uh, item one is the uh, proposals for the uh, traffic study. Uh, looks like we have three proposals, one from uh, McMahon, one from Kimley Horn, and another 
from uh, TPD. Um, grounds and maintenance, uh, or I'm sorry, the Buildings and Grounds Committee is recommending we move forward with the uh, McMahon uh, proposal. Um, I reviewed all three myself. I believe that the McMahon proposal is the most uh, comprehensive. Um, I think one thing we want to uh, check on this is that uh, we want to make sure that the deliverable includes recommendations that um, uh, you know we can evaluate to you know go on with further choices. Like the recommendation shouldn't be let's do another study. The recommendations should be you know we need to make these list of improvements or these list of improvements or these you know a menu of different you know kind of options that we should move forward with. Um, that's all I have on that. I don't know if Jackie wants to add anything else to that discussion. Uh, thank you, Dave. I think we're looking forward to moving this forward. We've been talking about this for a long time and McMahon definitely had the most comprehensive proposal. And I can definitely clarify with them that the product or the output should have options. That, that's what I'm hearing from you, right? They did say they would pro provide a report with recommendations, but I'm also hearing we should have several options. Did I hear that? Yeah, that, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Uh, you know, some of the other ones, the deliverables were just, you know, like, oh, we'll give you the results of the study, which is a bunch of like car counts, and you know, what do we do with that? It's not really helpful for our decision right. process. Right. Yes, we're definitely looking for recommendations, and we did check with K and W, the civil engineer that we've been using for the last couple of projects, and they've worked with McMahon, and they feel very comfortable. So if we move forward with the project on the main campus, we would likely recommend recommend KW and they have worked with McMahon before uh, with their traffic studies and feel very comfortable. So if if the committee is comfortable uh, moving this forward to the full board, that's what we would like to do so that we could get started. All right, I make a motion that we move this proposal forward to the full board. Second. Thank you. All right. Uh, item number two, we have a presentation uh, by Dr. Soder on the curriculum and instruction general fund budgets. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Soder. Okay. So each year we take a look at the instructional budget. So tonight you'll actually hear from, from me regarding curriculum instruction. You'll hear from Dr. Marchini for pupil services and uh, from um, Mr. San Francisco for technology. So, oops, they all look <laughs> the same. <laughs> no. That's it. Thanks. Um, typically, the curriculum instruction budget is one where uh, remember that our our budget is on a revision cycle, and so we have a large area of focus, so a large dollar amount in one year. And then that decreases, and then you have another area that uh, that will be considerably larger, as well. Our our current budget was specific, um, specifically changed this year because some of the things that we had originally put into this budget were then covered by ESSER funds through during the year. So we did make some shifts, and are we're actually doing some purchasing for um, some of the software and things that we need now. So again, our, the changes are typically determined by our revision cycle. So our current subject area, as you have seen from, from the texts that have come forward, have been for our world languages and for mathematics. Of course, we always have you know, AP whenever that sort of comes up. Next year, we would be looking at the revision that is up is uh, language arts and um, our guidance and health and PE. So we do see an increase um, this coming year for science. This is including some of the materials that we will be purchasing for our new STEAM courses at the elementary level. We see an increase in, in mathematics, not so, that is actually the number that's assigned here for next year is actually more the typical amount. This year's amount, we, were, we actually had purchased a good bit of the everyday mathematics materials of the year before. And then when we had our, our hybrid year of students being in, students being out, we were making use of a digital product. So we were actually able to use those resources this year. So that's why our math number was considerably lower this year. Um, so uh, 
language arts, social studies, not a huge amount of change for, for those in these years. Curriculum writing, we had a large dollar amount associated with that this year in anticipation for developing uh, online courses. So that is considerably less for next year. Large number for software uh, renewals, that's actually our world language renewals that are in that number right now. So um, next year's number at 162 is much closer to what we typically have for our, for our renewals. Um, you'll see we have mailings, we have professional development that is also part of our curriculum budget. Um, special area subjects, there is an increase there that's also for the print resources for world languages, because that's our special area for this year. And then I think our next one, staff development, this is the budget that is used for professional learning for our faculty, so this includes the, la the largest portion of this budget is for our part time staff for when they are participating in professional development days they are here full time. So it's really their, their, their payment for those days. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of conferences this year, um, but we did have substitute costs that come from this budget. Software, which is our, our compliance software that we use. Books and supplies, this is for our professional learning, mostly for our induction, for our new teachers. And then there's always the non-certificated training, that's our compliance officer. Jumpstart and the and kinder camp. These are our summer programs. So we are using that larger budget for jumpstart. So sometimes when we have surplus there, then we use it throughout the year for instructional programming. But we will be returning to the three week program again this summer for jumpstart. So that is for students at the at the elementary level, the end of July, beginning of August, and. These are the budgets that we told you would be coming forward. You'd actually already looked at those, those programs earlier this year. Kinder Camp is our orientation program for our kindergarten children. That occurs in August, four days in, in August. Both of these programs are really just the staffing. We don't need additional um, in, instructional materials for these programs. It's just the staffing for our teachers and paraprofessionals who work in those programs. I think we have one. Yeah, that's it. Any questions for curriculum before we move on to pupil services? Okay. So I have a quick question. I just couldn't help but notice. I'm just curious about this. The the, the line items from the totals between the two years were exactly the same, despite increases and decreases. So I was just curious. Do you take a, a total number and work backwards and? budget accordingly? We or? do. Okay. We, we do until we can't. And then we come and say, OK, we can't. So um, but yes, that's that's what we really try to do. We try to stay within that each year. Um, so it because there are staffing costs in in both in all of these budgets, there's a different rate every year. So we we do have to have increases in those budgets in order to accommodate the the professional rate for all of the staff that are associated for substitutes or for professional services or for um, summer summer work that rate goes up every year so we do have to make those adjustments every year. Um, also, it would be good to mention that we we have professional learning and professional development really in all of our budgets so Dr Soders has. The, professional development for the new teachers and some curriculum writing and other things, but all of our building budgets um, and all of our other budgets also have professional development dollars embedded in them as well. We do have Title I funds that have to be spent for professional development, mm -hmm. and so those are also in those Title I schools. Can you, you just uh, walk us through, I don't know who this might be more directed at, um, or it's a general question. It, as we, we we had a discussion, I think, in the past about, um, if, for example, math, when we reduced the number of math credits to graduate. As we change sort of like the curriculum credit requirements and impacting, you know, we're doing the budgeting now. We might have a discussion about how, um, you know, if we're going to do the health and, uh, you know, PE stuff and say, do, you know, at, what's the state requirements? What's our requirement? We're going to add STEM. 
at what time do we decide our graduation requirement credits versus staffing budget? You know, it's, it feels like we might be a little out of order sometimes. And, and so uh, if, we, if we do reduce that and change that, how might that impact our budget and our staffing? We really like to have our program of studies approved in the fall. So we should be doing the work, have our program of studies approved in the fall, and then all of that, we run staffing, numbers, course selection, that gets embedded into the budget and we're good to go. So it really has to be done a year ahead of time. So for example, if we are running a new course that the board approved in the fall, it is included in our curriculum budget right now. That, that's actually how we begin that process. So we budget for the curriculum development for it, we budget for the materials for it, staffing. we budget for the staffing for it, and we make those decisions in the fall. So, so when, what's our drop dead date for um, making those decisions and having the board take action? So when, what, if we're working backwards to a date, what's the for, timeline? Like if we're gonna make a curriculum uh, credit, credit changes to what's required for graduation. Okay, so you would, you would be having those conversations in early fall and ideally you'd be making that decision in November because it would be going into your program of studies in December and then it's put into the budget for the, for the winter for the following year. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm just asking so we a as a right. board member. Yeah, it's a right. very good question. I was going to say, can you, can, can, do you want to explain how if we... So we're not going to talk out from the audience yet. I'm going to give public comment at the end and, and everybody can do it then. Do you, do you just want to quick sure. go over like for health and PE, for example, like talk about how that won't go into effect until because of... Right. So we're actually planning the, we, we're in the process of, of taking a look at that and bringing a proposal to the board in May, but you would not be making a change for that if, if there is a recommended change for graduation requirements until the fall because you would be putting it in the new program of studies for the for the following year. If okay. you were to try to make a change for that right now because the structure of, of the course and how those things are scheduled, you potentially would need to be changing IEPs that are written for next year. So you want enough lead time for how you are going to be doing that kind of scheduling well in advance of making a change. Okay. And I think that when, when, we, when we share that in the proposal, I think that might be a bit more clear to everyone, but you want, a, you want ample time for all of the, all of the people concerned to make a change regarding anything with your graduation requirements because it, it will impact most significantly your special education students. Okay. So in that example, May, May we're gonna see a proposal, but really falls the action time for the board. It is. Right, okay. Are we ready for Dr. McKinney on the Pupil Services budget? All right. Uh, so there's three main components of uh, the budget I'm gonna to present tonight. One is the Pupil Services budget. The other is our um, Individuals with Disability Education Act funds. And the third is access. Uh, I'll just start with pupil services. The pupil services budget is for, uh, it's built uh, based on actual student numbers, actual students' needs. Um, it's also for special ed and regular ed students, and does include other things like um, vocational education, nursing guidance, psychological services gifted, chapter 15, uh, child accounting, census, legal, uh, et cetera. Um, there's right now, there are approximately 1,095 special ed education students this year. So this budget is based on that. Um, if you look through on the first page there, there's a couple of things that jump out as far as uh, cost increases to the budget for next year. One is the learning support of 397 students. However, that increase of 254 really only represents about seven or eight uh, students that we send to the IU that uh, the tuition and services are extensive enough that it's uh, a huge cost. Um, the other one that you see there is the uh, other special education programs of 86,000, and that includes our discovery program, um, as well as other IU services for our high school life skill students and our adult classes. Um, they go out part-time for uh, services and work, work study, 
um, and there's an increase uh, in students in that program for next year. And then uh, that also includes the uh, transition programs. And then the vocational education program that you can see uh, is based on the students that we send part-time, uh, the Homeland Security and also the police program full-time. Um, there's a small, it's based on per student and those students receiving those programs. So there's a uh, small savings in the budget there. On the second page of that, uh, some things that jump out are some uh, small savings, uh, not small, but 71,000 are student agreements. I'm trying to mainstream those where, uh, because there haven't been so many agreements over the last five years, others have uh, aged out. Um, so we're at this point at about $100,000 a year. And most of that is uh, two or three students for tuition and also compensatory services of you know, five or $10,000 per student. And then the other one you might see, uh, extended year program, um, based on the number of students that qualify, uh, we're seeing, and we're seeing a small savings there. The next part of this, oh, uh, do you have questions on that? What's yeah, a, What's a transition program? Uh, transition program, um, what happens is that we have our students in our high school life skills program and then they go into the adult life skills program, community connections. As they go through, they have to have uh, more extensive transition programs than other students, let's say who plan to go to college, vocational, et cetera. Um, and so part of that is to, as they're in our community connections program, the IU provides a work program for them. Um, it's a great program. They go to local businesses, companies. They have uh, um, folks from the IU with them during the whole time and they learn different job skills, uh, work, et cetera. And that's, the idea is that they could stay in some of those, those jobs and programs after turning 21 and graduating from high school. Okay, so they haven't graduated from high school yet when they're in that transition program. Now most of the, in students in the community connections, uh, they hold their diploma after 18 and they can be educated till 21 and they choose that. So that's why I call it the adults program. They're in that program. Okay. Um, most of them go to school uh, half day and then go out to another experience the second half of the day. Okay, thanks. Yep. I have a quick question. Um, for psychological services, I'm, I'm sorry if you touched on this, um, why is there such a decrease if that's something we want to concentrate on? Yeah, so you'll notice um, in another part of the budget that there's an uh, increase. So we have access funds and we're able to utilize those funds and we have uh, more available to us next year. So though there's a slight, there's a decrease of 84, you'll see an increase of almost $200,000 uh, in a line item in the next second page forward. Can we just back up one slide? I had a question on the charter school stuff. Yep. Or maybe one more. It's the very first line of the first page. Not that page. Yeah, there you go. That's it. Um, so 192 students, and then you have two different years and a budget. When you're, I'm looking at the students on the left-hand side, does that represent the, the path this past year or the future budgeted year? Well, the 21-22 year is the one that's current, 3.59. So 192 students are current in the 21-22? Correct. Okay. And you're budgeting down a number of students? We are. Okay. Is that... And what's the ratio of cyber charter versus in-person in charter, charter here, or is this? It's significantly, oh, oh yeah. go ahead. Okay. No, that's all right. No, go ahead. Uh, we have um, approximately, I'd say 60 students, 65 students in um, brick and mortar. Oh, okay, so right. it's predominantly cyber it charters, is. this is. Large yeah. portion. That's where we saw the large increase. Um, and you'll see it in the overall budget presentation. We saw a large increase in cyber the first year of COVID, and we haven't gotten them all back yet. Let's put it that way. So we're seeing a trend down. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen that already. Um, we're projecting this out for the beginning of next year as continuing to trend down a little bit. Um, we also see uh, different spikes in some years for uh, brick and mortar uh, kindergarten charter. Um, in some some of our elementary schools, we might have as many as twenty or thirty decide to go to. Uh, brick and mortar elementary. Um, we are seeing a rapid decrease in that area as well. Could, could we, for budgeting purposes, break those two line, two line items? Sure. You want to see the brick and mortar versus the cyber 
charter. Yeah. Sure, we can yeah, do that. Just so we go forward, we can turn yep. that to yeah. kind of. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. Okay, to move on to Individuals with Disability Education Act. Okay, so this is uh, federal dollars that come through um, IDEA, and it's based on our enrollment of special ed students. Um, we're seeing, and we get an actual allotment of funds from this. Um, we're seeing an a increase next year, and you can see how we item, itemized it out. Um, some of it is, this isn't directly by students, because you see some of our transition services high school, that's an actual staff member from the IU that we're increasing, and that's for, uh, not for those students we were just discussing, for seniors in high school who are, uh, have IEPs and also need transition services. Um, the facilitators are in there, the special ed supervisor, uh, emotional support, um, and then Chester County Intermediate Unit Placements. That's zeroed out because you saw in the earlier pupil services budget that it was increased based on those placements. Um, software, and then the CEIS services is a uh, mandated 15%, and that's based on uh, services that we provide for students pre-referral before they become uh, IEP students. So one of the uh, big expenditures there is our uh, behavioral specialist at the elementary schools, uh, board certified behavior um, assessment professional, BCBA. And we Im implemented that two or three years ago in order to help those students that are struggling with some of their behaviors, which is, um, you know, uh, created by a number of different factors, but we don't, don't want to automatically categorize them with an IEP and evaluation before we can see if we can assist them with that. Um, so those services are 15% and next year that's 185. Of the total budget, you mean? 15? Of the total uh, IDEA budget, yeah. Okay. You said there was an increase in special education um, students. Is that due to increase in diagnosis of already our, our current students, or is that an increase in students coming here? We're seeing an increase um, in, in the pre preschool uh, students that we see coming forward. So as the as the students start first grade, we're seeing a bubble coming up. Um, our trend is we're seeing more students um, for emotional support needs uh, coming into second, third, and fourth grade. The access funds. Um, this is uh, a program that we we utilize. That's we actually uh, bill for all the related services and IAPs to uh, medical assistance, and then we get reimbursements. Um, we're able to, we've been very successful in, in being accountable to all this billing. Um, so our usual budget's about $600,000 a year uh, for this. Um, we're actually able to increase that this year by a bit, and then next year by $200,000. Um, we're able to use that for special ed related services, since so we bill for that. Um, so some of the things from pupil services that we, you saw a decrease in, we're able to use this money, uh, these funds for it. Um, so one of the questions was psychological services. You see there's an increase in $165,000 in psychological services um, in the access budget um, when you had asked about a decrease in the pupil services budget. Can I ask a question about that? Yep. So that it says at the bottom there that that's for students that qualify for that. How do students qualify for that? These are so what happens medical is assistance. so the uh, we help the the parents sign up for medical assistance uh, through our office, and then uh, when they re re receive related services, and there's a specific number of different related services that qualify in the IEPs, um, we're able to uh, go in. Our paraprofessionals, teachers, psychologists, all the professionals are able to go into the system and put exactly what they're doing each week. That billing then goes into the access program and we're reimbursed for those funds. Does that answer your question? Okay. And our staff does a pretty phenomenal job. I think most of the schools that don't have these kind of funds, they don't put all that effort into actual um, tracking and billing for this. I think this is a really great thing we're doing and a good job on, on part of our departments here to, to allow our students access to more services by 
participating in these programs and getting reimbursement for it because it just expands our opportunity to hit, to, to hit more children with more services. So, um, you know, kudos to us for doing this this way. And then a small portion um, is school health services. Um, so we do provide different um, medical services, um, supplies, and then some people are surprised, but non-public health services, we do provide a small amount of services to private schools um, if they need it. Most don't take us up on that offer. And then the very last part is just, uh, if you go into your board docs, just links to the many different things that happen in the student services department. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, you, let's Dr. turn it over to uh, Paul for the proposed technology uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chief. This is great. <laughs> I don't like being over there. I got Frank. <laughs> I always like to do a highlight of what we're doing this year with the budget and every year, but this next year especially, we're gonna do cybersecurity. We've been doing cybersecurity for the nine years I've been here. Um, and as everyone knows, it's become more and more prevalent in every business, healthcare, education, and we just need to really ramp up what we're doing. And it's more not the back end, it's more of doing what's called tests on our network. We're hiring outside companies to really do a security example of what happens if the network and where our holes are. Because we're doing everything we can, but there's things that always create it every year, every something that comes to get a new patch or hole that we may not know, that we're vulnerable. So we're really concentrating on that. The IUs help us out, companies help us out. And we are very confident in our network but anything can happen. We're also gonna cross cybersecurity with personnel. A lot of this is training. We can have the greatest cybersecurity plan and network. All it takes is one person to give a password out, leave their computer open, and they download something and we're done. They've let the risk in. So we're gonna do a lot more with, and we've done a lot in the past, and our staff is awesome with sending my department emails that they think is fishy. And we, we vet them, we do that, the business office, superintendent's office, curriculum, everybody's really trained on this. And we go over spam emails all the time, but they're getting more sophisticated. And that's what we really have to concentrate on more staff development. Chromebooks, fourth grade, we're moving down to fourth grade this year. We're gonna replace iPads next year with Chromebooks. They are staying in school. Remember, we have really a cart-based, one-to-one uh, -one initiative on the elementary where it stays in the classroom. So we're replacing them with Chromebooks for the next year. Seventh grade, we're getting new Chromebooks because they're take home. And then our 10th graders will get new Chromebooks because their refresh is, is on now. Believe it or not, they're in their third year of using those Chromebooks, fourth year. So we'll do a seven, eight, nine, and then a 10, 11, 12. So every three years, we'll refresh that Chromebook. This does not affect the bottom line of the budget. It's just a normal refresh process and we can go through that. The fourth grade, the same thing. We are gonna offer an optional one-to-one -one for K-6 students. What does that mean? What we learned in COVID is many students, all of our students have access to a device. But the problem is it's a cell phone, it's an iPad, it's a Kindle that they've connected to the internet. So when we do what's called FID days or we have to close for whatever reason or something else happens, we need to make sure those students have access to a Chromebook or a device that handles video conferencing, that handles things like that. So we're going to give the same thing that we do in the secondary, but elementary will keep those at home. So if someone does need a device, they'll just pay the technology fee that we pay every year, and they'll get a school-issued device that they can keep home and use for education. So that's going to be optional for parents. And we talked to all the elementary principals, Dr. Stout, Ms. Crum Ryan, Ms. Uh, Dr. Soder, that's the only need we need right now. We don't feel doing a one-to-one -one K-12, having kids bring home Chromebooks and back and forth, the cart base is more realistic for our needs here. 
but having a device at home optional for parents to purchase would be through the district and the controls would be on and we would still monitor it like everything else. Steam rooms, very excited about the steam program that's going on. You know, we're doing a lot, outfitting more steam rooms with projectors, uh, monitors, uh, anything they need to teach those classes will come out of the technology budget from a presentation and instructional thing. The robots and things like that you've seen already, they're here, this is what we need to really teach. Data warehouse, we right now have a data warehouse that has done its job, uh, but now we're at a point where we need more access to data. We need more focus on where data is coming from. We need dashboards for teachers to see, to see where kids are. You know, with graduation requirements at the high school, we have to track keystones, track everything, who's competent in that, who's fulfilled it, who isn't. So the new data warehouse program will do this and more. I know some of board members got to see presentations. We had teachers, everything, vetted vendors, and we came down with a one vendor that is in the budget this year. Next slide. So the budget, you know, my budget basically stays the same really every year. And Mrs. Crumline, do you want to go over with the capital, how that's funded and? Sure, no problem, Mr. Sanfran. <laughs> um, per board policy, we transfer one mil, M-I-L-L, -L, of real estate taxes from the general operating fund over to the capital fund a year. It's approximately $2.4 million. One million of that is consistently funding technology capital. And that is how Mr. San Francisco is able to do his capital refresh, any new initiatives, make sure our copiers are in good shape, infrastructure, those types of yep. things. And remember, from what we've done, we've never asked for an increase in that budget. We've done timelines to really push out the Chromebooks, everything else, where we'd refresh everything in a year. Some districts do one big leases and just have a big hit and then it goes away, then it's a problem refreshing. We've done that with projectors, we've done that with computers, we've done that with the Chromebooks, really keeping consistent phase in, phase out, so the budget doesn't take those hits that we have are consistently budget. And you can see our copiers, the phones, everything, the replacement computers, the projectors reflect in that budget. Next slide. So the replacement computers, here's kind of a breakdown. We have the projectors, we did away with most of the 3Ms this year. Some of the older Epson projectors we placed next year. I work with Dr. Soder to see what divisions are getting curriculum uh, cycle, and we work to refresh their technology when the curriculum's recycled also, uh, or re, uh, redone that year. Laptops, our teacher laptops, we do my models. This year, the models we're doing are G2s, G3s, and they'll be updated all. That's, and staff, admin, uh, secretaries, admin positions, they're all included in that too. Replacement of the a Apple Air 2s, we have the lower grade Apple iMac, uh, iPads that need to be replaced, that's in this budget. And then building computers admin, any other computers around. So we have some standalones in the nurse's office, librarians, things like that, that need to be replaced, the checkout computers. We have them on a cycle too. This is the additional things. You have the Chromebooks in there. You have the fourth grade Chromebooks, and that's that total. And then our general fund, um, that is basically our software programs and things like that, My, uh, conferences, um, any, any training that happens comes out of this budget. Our website, our Skyward system, uh, board docs, everything is in this system, uh, my budget comes out of this budget right here. And that's not the capital budget, that's the operating budget. And that budget is based on whatever software's curriculum needs, admin needs, our needs, and the district, even our transportation software, everything's in that budget. So of course, there's some little increases, you know, software planes go up and that's all reflected in this part of that budget. Next slide. Questions? The admin software, what's driving that increase? Data warehouse. So the that's, data that's warehouse. The way, that's the data yeah. warehouse. So the data warehouse program we had did the job. This is adding much more components that we never had, especially the graduation requirements and the high school for tracking keystones and tracking everything we have to do. It's another module we had had to have this year to make it more streamlined for everything. Paul, on the one-to-one K to six Chromebook program, 
I assume that that's going to be by request. Yes. So how do you budget for that, not knowing how many they're going to So what we're, gonna do, we're doing is a survey. So we know, so remember, we know what parents still have Chromebooks from COVID. We never took those away. So they're coming end of life, and that's the problem, that after this year, many of those Chromebooks will not be able to upgrade it. So we're going to have to get them back. They can keep them, but they're not going to work with some things. So we have a budget number on, based on who has it. My thing is it's probably going to be less than we think, but it's still going to be offered. So that's how we base that number on. Where in the budget is that number? So that's under the Chromebook, the Chromebook numbers. I see additional computer systems yes. on page five. Yes. I don't see a one-to-one -one for K to six. I only see Chromebooks grade four, seven, and 10. So, they're the, so what we have in that budget is the additional computers. It's not a line item for that optional one-to-one. -one. It's within our additional, if you go back to that slide, it says additional, right? Keep going. Next one. Right there. It's the replacement computers, projectors right there. Additional computer systems, that second line, I have it in that budget right there. Right, but when I look at page five, which has that total number, 480,000, I don't see any one-to-one -one in there. So let's go back to that one, right? This one? Yes. Yeah, that's just for the Chromebooks for the one-to-one -one for seven and 10 and fourth. I put the Chromebook one just for the optional one-to-one -one in that other slide. It's, we didn't break that down to so that. There's two sets of 480,000? No, it's just one. No. It's just one. Well, to, to clarify, is it um, optional for parents to opt in and purchase yes. through the district? Correct. Correct. Right. With their own funds. Well, they'll just pay the technology fee. Okay. Right. All right. I so just we, want to be clear. I'll break down that money. It, it's, it's not clear here. It's, it's missing, but I'll make sure we get that to the board. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Mr. San Francisco? There you go. Thank you. All right. Uh, 705, uh, we've got the preliminary budget presentation by Mrs. Carbride. Thank you, Mr. Hermanos. Okay, thanks. The first thing that's on here is the uh, budget timeline. So we're just working our way through the budget timeline and we're in March. So you can see that we're, we're, we've reviewed our uh, staffing recommendations and our instructional cost center budgets. At the end of this month, we're planning to present the non-instructional cost center budgets, such as transportation facilities, as well as capital improvement plan. Um, and then really a final proposed budget so we really just wanted to provide you with an update today on where we are today. So if you go to the next slide. Next slide, sorry. This is an easy way to look at um, the different, I'm going to call them buckets of money that the district has. So we have different funds and the general operating fund is approximately $122.2 million. And that is for the annual operations of the district. That, that budget will zero out every year and we start all over again. That's really fun, funded by uh, revenue from local, state, and federal sources. The next bucket of money, per se, is our internal service fund. So that, is, that accumulates all of the dollars that the district contributes and employees contribute toward health care, and all of the expenditures for health care for our employees come out of that particular fund. The next fund is the capital projects fund. We're really required to have a long-term plan with PDE. And then we also, we also are permitted to fund and issue bonds. So if we're issuing bonds, which we're not right now, that's where the proceeds from any bonds would go, any transfers over from the, cap, from the general operating fund, and then the expenditures for capital improvement projects would go out of that fund. So that's that bucket of money. The um, next fund is the food service fund. That runs about $2.2 million on an average year. We are working towards making that a self-sufficient fund. We definitely struggle in that regard because you know, labor rates are what they are and we don't wanna raise our prices too high. So it's always a balancing act. 
Student Activity Fund, we're just custodial fiduciary in nature. The Student Activity Funds are really uh, accumulated and held in trust for the students and their activities. And then the Debt Service Fund, we pay approximately $8 million a year um, in debt. And that money is included in that general fund number, and it's transferred over to the Debt Service Fund. Thank you. I just wanted to share some significant revenue trends that we're seeing this year. So for federal revenue, we talked about this a little bit before. We have the Essers dollars and the cliff is coming, and that is coming in 2003-04. So you'll see when you look at the revenue dollars, we're starting to trend that down. So it's going from 2.6 to 2.4 million. 2.6 to 2.4 million. Future additional funding is unknown at this time. Hopefully we're out of the woods, um, but I'll knock on wood for that. Access continues to be a strong funding source, and you heard Dr. Marchini talk about that. So we're seeing an increase in our access dollars, which actually helps offset uh, the dollars needed for special education and the impact on our taxpayers. State revenue, right now we really have level, uh, level subsidy funding, particularly in the area of special education. So right now, the, the dollars that we receive for education for special education to about $2 million from the state, we're severely underfunded. The state severely underfunds the mandates and the mandated costs that we're required by the state um, to provide. Not that we shouldn't provide them, it's just that they're underfunding it. So I just want everybody to be, to be aware of that. And this year's governor's budget, and it did last year too, I've sent out mm, updates on this every once in a while, it includes a significant amount of money for education. Now, that being said, it did last year too, and we really didn't see those dollars. So by the time the budget is approved, uh, and goes to the General Assembly and, and it's into law, it doesn't mean that we're going to see all of those dollars. So we're very cautious in including any preliminary budgets into our budget. So I just want you to know, it includes our normal funding that we receive from the state that's true, tried and true over time. It doesn't include all of those additional funds. If at the end of the day, we get some, they'll be reflected in the final budget, okay? Um, transportation, if you recall, we, we shut down, I'm sure you recall, in March of 2020, and we were not running our school buses. So when we went to obtain reimbursement, last year our revenue was down because it always lags a year. Well, now for next year, we're projecting that to go back up to where it was before. So we did build that increase into the budget. Local revenue, um, it's interesting. We, we don't have a lot of assessment growth in our school district, although the county as a whole is seeing significant assessment growth. And the assessment is what you apply your tax or millage rate to to generate your revenue. So just so that you would know where we are, we have an average growth of 11.7% from 2007 to 2022, which is less than 1% a year if you're averaging that out. And that's your assessment growth. Property tax appeals, the good news is we're losing less revenue. <laughs> so for example, last year we lost $560,000 due to property tax appeals and assessments being lowered and us refunding taxpayers' dollars. So we're, this past year, it was $298,000. So that is improving somewhat for now anyway. Earned income tax revenue and transfer tax revenue. This is something that we were pleasantly surprised about. <laughs> During the pandemic, we originally, remember everything shut down in, in 2020, and we, we didn't know what our earned income tax revenue would look like. We get a half a percent of earned income tax, EIT revenue, and so do the townships and the boroughs. So we were really conservative in our estimates. Actually, people worked from home and they continued to be paid for the most part in our community. So we are seeing, it's a one year bump, but we're seeing about a 12%, it's about a million dollars in the 22-23 budget. We're not going to see those types of increases ongoing. It's just, we're leveling back up again because we really, we really didn't see the loss that we anticipated in earning income tax revenue because people worked from home and continued to be productive. The next two charts, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I wanna make sure um, that you know where our grant money is coming from. So the first slide is a chart and it is totaling cumulative to date grant dollars related to COVID. So you have every dollar and you have every category of grant revenue. 
obviously the red and the blue and the royal blue, they're the largest and that's really our ESSER, ESSER funding. The others are either one-time grants or um, emergency type relief that either the governor or federal government issued. Now, if you look to the next slide, you'll be able to see how we actually are spending those dollars. And we do have, just so everyone's aware, on our website under the finance department, there's a COVID finance update where we're listing. As we get dollars in, we keep a cumulative total there. We, we share what we're spending our dollars on. So just, just to highly summarize, we're, we were using and continue to use the COVID dollars for things like um, nurse and maintenance overtime, the scholastic coaches, tutors, reading specialists, teachers on assignments. And we are gonna continue those teacher on assignments for 2022-23. I forgot to mention that during staffing. So any of the MTSS coordinators, teachers on assignment, we anticipate having another year of assistance from those folks through the ESSERS dollars. We used it for Cyber Academy staff this year, additional staff that was needed. Um, any substitute teacher costs that were above and beyond, and they were above and beyond because we were in the middle of COVID. Professional services, additional mental health supports, cleaning the buses. Now we're not doing that um, anymore. We're, we're outside of that extreme COVID um, time period, I should say. And technology support, intervention specialist, when we had the class, the cameras for the classrooms. So all of these types of things, we were using ESSERS and we really made the determination that we're going to use it to, to, to the greatest benefit for the students. So really trying to allocate the resources that we were receiving down as close to the students as we could get it. You know, some schools may be purchasing HVAC equipment or whatever. We're trying not to do those types of things. We're trying to make the best use of the dollars that we're receiving. This is just a, a graph of the special education, the funding gap. So you're seeing how much we receive, and it's been pretty consistent over time, but our expenses are increasing due to the state mandates. Luckily, we do receive a good amount of grant revenue to help us with that. Then for 22-23, I just wanted to share what's driving our expenditures for cost drivers. We did reinstate the board policy, uh, 601.3, to transfer, to continue the transfer, because we put that on hold, uh, the one mill of real estate taxes from the general fund to the capital fund. So that is built back into this budget. PEASERS and healthcare benefit increases of approximately 1.8 million or 6%. Um, salary increases of approximately 1.9 million or 3.9%. So we have our contracted salary increases projected, but then we also do have some new programs in there, um, the special education guidance, and just our regular enrollment driven FTE changes. Then the next expenditure that definitely drives um, our budget, and we talked a little bit about this before, are the cyber charter school tuition costs. So <laughs> there's a chart for this next, but we in 2021, we were at $3.8 million. That was a large spike due to COVID and students leaving to go to public charter schools. Um, for this current year, we budgeted 3.6 million. Our actual costs are projected to be 3.3. So that's very good news. We're in a downward trend. Unfortunately, the rates are going up again. So even though the student count is going down, the costs are staying level. It's really anything that we can do to help uh, speak with our legislators about how this is funded would be greatly appreciated. It's, it's definitely a struggle um, that in how the school districts are funding charter schools. Jackie, fund can I just, can I just add, I was at a superintendent sure. meeting uh, last week and looking at the IU budget and um, BVA, the virtual, vir the virtual academy program, Brandywine Virtual Academy that the IU runs, they said it costs about $5,000 per student, but the districts are being charged sixteen to $17,000 by these cyber charter schools. It is ludicrous. Uh, and again, I don't want to make a public <laughs> statement here, but it, it's, it's ludicrous. It is. That you, you can do this service for four or $5,000, and we're being charged sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars um, for, I would, I would argue, a lesser service that is being done at BVA. So sorry, sorry for interrupting. But Please I, do. That's but when a, I saw that slide last week, it just infuriated me. It is. It's very frustrating because 
really a brick and mortar, a charter school that has a building versus a cyber charter school, we have to pay them the same amount of money and one doesn't have any infrastructure. So that's really, it's really one of the big And the issues. 16, 18,000, that's just without services. If someone gets diagnosed with a speech therapy, um, $32,000, $32, not because it costs $32,000 to do, give that service, just because they take the average of all the special education. It's oh, a formula. formula mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what the kid actually needs. No. But those same cyber charters are not required to take special need kids with the higher cost. They can just right. pick and choose so they can sort of cook the books to get to the 32000 And we pay the 32000 Our taxpayers do. Right? We pay the, the cyber and brick-and-mortar charter schools directly from our budget. So that's... That's that line item. Okay, I'm all set about that. The next slide is just an idea or a depiction of how much we pay into the state, uh, the employers pay into the state pension system. So we're paying approximately 35% of payroll um, into the state employee retirement system. The, the incremental increases are well within management. The years that we really had trouble <laughs> balancing this was really between 2010, 11, up through 17, 18, and we had put some plans and reserves in place for that. So incrementally, we're in good shape with that now, although it is a very big chunk of the budget. The next slide is just a depiction of the charter school costs. So you can see in 1920, we were around 2.7 million. 2021, really our first full year into COVID, that's when we really saw the spike. And then 21, 22, we're, we're leveling back out again. We'll never, I don't think, unless they change the tuition rates, get back down to 2.7 million. Um, so I think this is where we are. Hopefully we don't lose more, let's put it that way. So we always want them to come here first, students. The next slide is, just so that the board understands there are contractually obligated costs, which make up a significant portion of our budget. So that's around 88% of the budget, or $1.7 million. So we have employment contracts when we're not negotiating, um, special education, charter school tuition, those things that we've talked about, long-term debt, um, student transportation is required, and there are certain curriculum and staff development required to meet our state standards. Everything on the left is really where we have a lot more discretion uh, with our with our funds and what we do and do not do. Okay, next page. This is really just a depiction of where we are um, with the 22-23 budget from our local state and revenue source standpoint. You can see that the local revenue is really being increased by, um, you'll see later, we're proposing a 1.98 under 2% tax increase. So the, the difference really is being made up by the earned income tax revenue right now. And we do see that there's transfer, you know, people are still buying homes and building homes and there's, the construction got a little bit of a low start, but, or, or slow start, but I, I do think that that's going to continue. Um, and then federal resources, state resources are just our reimbursements. The bump is due to the transportation um, subsidy we anticipate more next year, leveling that back out again. And then starting the decrease on the federal funding, mostly the COVID. So that'll start this year and it will end in 2023, 20, 24. And then the next slide is where we are with right now, as of today for our projected expenditures or budget set a glance. And I, I will say that we, we are very, it's really important how we allocate our resources um, this is a significant amount of money, and it is very important that we're allocating our resources most as prudent as we can and in the best direction possible to most to benefit our students. You're going to see two areas off to the right that have footnotes. So administrative support cost centers, you're going to see a, an increase there because we are reinstating the transfer to the capital fund. So that's why you're seeing that increase. And then for total other district programs, that million dollar difference, those are really expenditures that are offset by revenue. So that's part of ESSERS. So you're seeing an increase there, but it's offset on the revenue side. So there's really no net increase. 
So we're projecting for 22-23 that we will be in a slight deficit position, but we had planned for this, and at the year ended June 30, 21, and you'll see it on our financial statements, we set aside funds so that we could, because we had savings that year, so that we could reinstate the capital transfer. So we're going to use that reservation of fund balance for 22-23 to balance the budget. In your backup, you'll see projections for another three years beyond this year, and you'll see that we're able to then level everything out and our budgets are balanced moving forward. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. The next graph just shows the county tax base. And you'll see that Chester County's uh, CES based tax base is, is increasing significantly. And as a comparison, because we do, Dr. Stout described this before, we do rely, next slide, Paul, please. We do rely on our, our the residents in the community because we, do have, we really don't have any commercial property. So our, you know, one good thing is you're, we're, we're slow and steady, but we don't have a good commercial tax base. And then the last slide just shows you really the 10-year history of our tax increases. The preliminary 22-23 increase projected at 1.98%. Our average over 11 years is around 2%. And the Act 1 index for next year is at 3.4%. So, any questions? I have a quick question just to go back to that. Sure. Uh, earned income sure. tax for this year. You yep. mentioned that that's likely something that we wouldn't be able to count on for next year. It was sort of just uh, because of the pandemic, it was something that we got uh, from this past year. So I'm curious how that impacted your thought process with allocating that in the budget if we can't count on it for future years. Did you spend it all in the budget or can we hold it back in reserve somehow? I'm just curious how you... Well, since it. our budget isn't balanced, so we're already $2.4 million in needing to draw from fund balance. I sh maybe I said it incorrectly. We're going to see increases. We'll continue to see increases, just not 12%. So next year it could be 6%. So the half a million dollars is really going directly to our salary and benefit line items. That's where we're seeing, where we're projecting increases. Does that make sense? How much, what, like just a general ballpark figure of the ESSER funds are we looking at needing to come up with like in future years when it goes away? Like what kind of dollars is that? Well, quite honestly, <laughs> we are not planning to reinstate all of the things that we used money for for right. ESSERs, right? Right, okay. So yeah. we, I mean, we, we are talking about it all the time at Cabinet about which we know that when that cliff falls, we're going to have so many people asking for things. So... We're very cognizant of that, and we know that we're not going to be able to say yes to everything. You know, we'll need to prioritize, and it will have to be incremental. So we don't have an exact number yet, okay. but we're very okay. well aware. The ESSER funds, are they use it or lose it, like at the end of every year? Or? Um, no, it's really a um, grant money that we apply for, we receive, and then we receive it like once a month, you know, based on either reimbursement or allocation. So we, if we don't spend it, we won't, we'll have to, we'll have to give it back or we, we won't have any trouble spending it though, honestly. And, and I mean, it's we have for such, certain things. We can't just right. spend it on no. like baseball uniform. It's, it's no. specific what you have to spend, right. what categories you have to spend it on. Right, that's a good point. I'm finished, Ms. Dave. Okay, any more uh, questions for Ms. Crumrine on the budget presentation? Okay, uh, let's move on to a food service program update summary. And I believe Mrs. Crumrine is going to present that as well. Sure, thank you. This is just a quick update. We did open, uh, we did have our bid opening today for our food service management contract. PDE requires that we go out to bid every five years. So I just wanted to let you know we opened the bids today. We obviously hadn't have, haven't had time to go through them or do any of our due diligence. We received bids from Chartwells, our existing contractor, from METS, and from Nutrition Group. 
So those are the three bids that we received. So we'll be evaluating and probably making a recommendation in time for the April school board meeting. Okay. And then there's just a list of grants. Mr. Frill had asked for a list of grants outside, above, and beyond our federal and state reimbursement that we have applied for over the years or are in the process of applying for. They're not large dollars, but every little, every little bit helps. So I did include that in your, in your packet. Looks like there's about $35,000 worth of grants there. Mm -hmm. Right, and actually, some good news, the manager of the giant store uh, sent an email today, and you know how they do those um, round up and donate to your local, whatever the cause is, so for the, the month that they did uh, Hungry Kids or Hungry for Kids, they'll, they're going to be providing us with a check for $4,000 so just from our local giant, which is, they're very supportive. That's great. Thanks, Jackie. And so I appreciate the grant thing. Just to, so the board, the reason I asked for that is um, there's some grants that go to like, lo, you know, it's, it's food service related, some of it about local farms to how do we get them into um, school lunches and school programs and there's some of that kind of stuff. I said, do we do any of that kind of stuff? And we do, we take advantage of that. So Ms. Carmen, I was kind of have to kind of put that over there in there so we can see how some of that local stuff can make its way into, you know, O and, o and J. And then I think the trick of this too is some of this is just like, how do we, make it easily accessible to the public of what we're doing kind of celebrate some of these things too because some of the stuff is really good stuff in here and just how do we make everybody aware of it because it's there and it's you know you just got to find it <laughs> so instead of playing like where's waldo and trying to find this and that i think we just you know as part of that communications audit as we do it like what are the things that we want to highlight and put out there and then as we're doing the new food service um bid and i knew it was coming up i just want to make sure we had an understanding of how this stuff all integrates and what's related to Chartwells, what's related to us, and just you know, making sure that the board could, as we do that food service next month or whatever, whenever you make the recommendation, we, we understood it. So that's- yeah, I have a question about food service. Um, I know in the past, I think like maybe when the last board was, was touring the food service, we were asking about sustainable materials for what the children get served on. Is that something that we can open up as a topic of discussion during these uh, negotiations or grants or, uh, I'm sorry, not grants, the, the uh, bids? We can always bring that up with which, whatever food service management company we hire. So we can definitely have those conversations. But is, would it be appropriate to put some, you know, like if we wanted to have a goal to use so much percentage recyclable or compostable material, would it be appropriate to put that in as a, a request or a requirement? It would, but we already issued the bid and the bids were due today. Um, ah, so okay. I really couldn't go backwards on that, but honestly, the, those companies would work with us and they would be able to provide us what, what those additional costs would be depending on whatever you're interested in. Yeah, so my understanding having asked this question is we can direct that to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Sure. It's just a pass through. Um, it's a pass through. It's a pass through exactly. cost. So we can, you know, Jennifer, to your point, we, we can as a board kind of come up with that if that's part of our goals and then get, get a, but I think once it's awarded, we'd work with whoever the awarded um, group is to then provide us with, okay, here's a budget if we're using, you know, plastic and here's one if we're using you know gold spoons or whatever you know it doesn't matter what it is just they could provide us the sustainable like no styrofoam here's what it is here's what your cost would be based on our usage and then we as a board can then just or as a, you know as a district can decide yeah that's what we want to do here you go and then you know the, the other food service thing we should think about too is it's going to come up is it's it's intended to be a pass through, right? It's not intended to be a net operating budget loss to school districts. The way food service is set up is you're required to run a food service program, but it's it's supposed to be funded, you know, by pricing of the 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 lunches. Self sufficient, right. It has yet to do that. So the question is, what's the appropriate menu with the appropriate pricing, with the appropriate stuff to get close to that? So that's a decision that we as a group are going to have to make once this is awarded and we're talking that menu pricing. 
Well, it is interesting, and I can share this, all three companies that provided bids have us making a profit and they guarantee a profit. So it should be interesting yeah. uh, as we review. So we'll have more to talk about. Bring on the sustainability. All right. Interesting enough, I was speaking with some uh, students that were in student council, and uh, that was an important thing to the student councils that uh, they use some sustainable products for serving. And uh, they were asking me, you know, how do we bring that to the board? And I said, well, I'll put a presentation together, but looks like um, that might be something that we can address uh, now. Definitely. And I think um, Heather Bonner, the director of dining services, she meets with the student council group every month at the high school. So um, we should definitely have them speak to her about that, too, because she'll be able to to work on the I, think, I think this was one of the elementary student councils oh, okay. that, that I was speaking about, but okay. they, about they, uh, uh, they want to know what was happening with that. So I'll uh, report to them that we're looking into it. I say open invitation to any uh, grade school student government that want to speak to the board. Uh, you can come and speak to the board about this and we'd be Excellent. happy to hear it. I was um, going to say, if we already have something like that going on where they meet with her, can't we just get that info presented to us on a more regular basis? Sure. Um, regarding the feedback from the students, yeah, we can. I can. She would be happy to do that. She'd be happy to do that. We can include it in board line. And then um, I'll wait till we're done this session. Any other questions on this? I think that wraps us up for um, finance, buildings, and grounds. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, Paul. So before I'm going to open it up for public, anybody, you know, public uh, Zoom or here, uh, if you have questions for what we've talked about tonight, if we can answer the question, we will just be a dialogue. Um, but before any request for information or anything uh, new business for the board before I do that. <laughs> All right, so if you have a question regarding the agenda that we went over tonight for the working session, um, if there's anybody on Zoom, Paul, just let me know and I'll, I'll you know, let them do that, so. Hi, Colleen Blute, North Coventry, East Coventry Township. I had originally come up here to speak to you about something else, but there was a statement made and it bothers me. As an educator, it bothers me beyond bothering me that a school board member would have stated this, if I'm correct in what was stated. The board member stated, I notice a high number of special education students and low income students. Do we need more staff? I bit my tongue. I almost got up and screamed. Just because a child is a low income child does not mean that they are a low achieving student. I have seen low income students become doctors and one of them is now a vet and is teaching a graduate level course in Austin and came from a low income family. She was not a low achieving student. She was a high achieving student. When I heard that board member say that, I wasn't sure I heard it correctly and I hope I didn't. Thank you. All right, Heather McCurry, East Coventry. Um, you guys know what I'm going to bring up. I don't understand why we're talking about charter school expenses, this and that, right now, you, but nothing ever changes here in Owen J. Roberts. We've brought up the topic of the excess gym classes. Again, the state requires 2.4 credits of health, sorry, excuse me, the state requires 1.0 credits of health and PE. Owen J. Roberts is requiring 2.4 credits of health and PE. In addition, most concerning is the fact that when the summer enrichment brochure came out, it's charging, you guys are charging $175 to kids to take a health class during the summertime that they don't even need. So Owen J. Roberts is profiting off the fact that they have not aligned their graduation requirements to the state requirements. Um, I sent you guys a pretty extensive email. So I'm just kind of summing it up here.
for you. And I don't understand why you can't fix it now. Now is the perfect time. Now is the time when you're approving the staff members. Now is the time when you're approving the budget. Now is the time when you're approving the teacher's contract. And when we fix the math credits in 2017, you actually have the data to show, did that drop down the math teachers immediately? No, it did not. Um, this probably wouldn't have any effect on the gym classes for next year because the kids that you are actually hitting are the 11th and the 12th graders that want to take more academics. So they're actually signing up for the ONJ Roberts program and paying money to take extra credits that they shouldn't have to so that they can have academics, which you guys have right in your listening session, is one of the themes, right? One of the themes I talked to Dr. Lehman out in the hall before the meeting, and she says that the science curriculum um, require, uh, the science curriculum, whatever the fancy words are, are changing so that the focus is going to be on more engineering and more STEM classes. But yet you guys have the power to change and just to sit and say, you know what, we're going to take a motion, we're going to drop down the requirements for gym and health. You don't have to wait two years to do it. There's so many things we talk about here that just get on hold forever. We talked about the deleveling in the middle school. That got on hold forever. You're losing the person that promoted the IB program, uh, Dr. Richardson, Mr. Richardson, but you were not going to. Um, we, we talked about putting IB diploma in. We talked about putting AP Capstone in. AP Capstone, there's actually a presentation that we did two years ago, $18,000 to put that in. Now is the time to be making those changes, not waiting five, seven more years. Um, in addition, other schools that are requiring more than the 1.0, maybe. I think actually the 1.0 is a new drop, which I wrote to you guys about. But other schools are actually allowing alternative credit for club sports, team sports, and marching band. That's something you could do right away. I personally think you should drop it right away because it's the right thing to do. That's our mission, doing the right thing at the right time. But you guys are actually charging kids to take classes that they do not need to take. That's really actually not fair, is it? So you can't sit and complain that people are leaving and going to charter schools and whatnot when you won't focus on the academics here. Really is the time to do it right now. And look at the other academic topics too. And with the late start, that's been going on for seven years now. We determined in 2019-20 that start time could be pushed back 15 minutes without any um, action, that the administration could actually do it on their own. You could at least start now and push it back 15 minutes and see what happens. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Hello, my name is Mark DeFusco, East Coventry resident, president of the Roberts Education Association. I want to talk a little bit about staffing and policy 126A. Uh, again, just a question of how we are actually reducing staffing for the core teachers by 0.1 in the high school. And we currently have the two largest classes, I believe in Owen Roberts history as the graduates of 23 and the graduates of 22. Plus we're adding at least 40 more kids in the building again next year, but we're reducing those class, reducing core area and not adding any. Um, currently, we are, the, I don't know what the uh, policy is, 126A says that there should be no more than 28 students in a classroom on the first day of the year, first day of the school year, and that's routinely ignored, so already, um, I can't imagine that we're going to be any luckier trying to uphold that policy next year with not, with not adding, even subtracting a point one. Um, since this year, there were many classes who had 31 from day one. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Mr. President, we have one person, Hunter Emery. Hunter, give your full name and township of residence. Hello, my name is Hunter Emery, North Coventry. Uh, on agenda item 5.01, you talk about the uh, listening, listening sessions. Uh, number three on that list is promoting competitive academics. If this is important to our school, I still do not understand why we require 2.4 credits in health and physical education. Other schools around us require 
around 1.8 credits. Um, for Downingtown, for example, requires uh, 1.66 credits in both uh, health and gym. Um, also, to my knowledge, uh, recently the state lowered its gym and health requirements from 1.6 to one credit. Uh, if based on like uh, the listening session themes, uh, we still aren't being as competitive as we can be. If an excess gym, like uh, the excess gym requirement is blocking students from taking more academic classes, which is not allowing Owen J. Roberts to be as competitive in economic in academics as it could be. Thank you. Thanks, Hunter. Appreciate that. Uh, quick question: Like, how many people take advantage of that summer program for um, gym? Or for what? Do you, do you have a sense of that off the top of your head? If not, you can follow up with a yeah, email. Yeah, we can put it in board line with last year's numbers. Yeah, just just a, just a sense and how much that is there. And then, obviously, there's questions that when we do our May, I think you said you're coming back in May for that. Just you know that we're capturing uh, community feedback in that presentation in May for for all this. Um, so we can answer these questions as, as we're going. Mr. Fur, there's one more. There's Don Sweeney. Okay. Don, full name and township of residence. Hi, Don Sweeney, Warwick Township. Um, I just want to add to the um, health and phys ed issue. It also affects um, special education students. A lot of times special ed kids are in learning support and they um, have two, three, five days of um, class period per day in, in learning support. Um, with this additional PE and, and health credit, that um, makes it difficult or, or, or possible to take things like art, music, um, and, and also affects their, um, uh, like driver's education, um, the extra curricular specials that they, they might take. So I, I really hope you can look at the, um, that and, and remedy it sooner than a year or two from now. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Regina Anderson, full name and township of residence, please. Hi, uh, Regina Anderson, um, South Coventry. Um, my daughter is a senior this year and she transferred in her, her junior year. Uh, she went to Boyertown previously and they did not require the level of phys ed and health classes that ONJ does. So for her senior year and her junior year, she had to add classes and she lost out on being able to take the sciences that she wanted to take to be able to go into the majors that she wants in college. Uh, to the point that she has, I think it's like a half a credit extra for this uh, semester. And uh, she asked to be able to drop it because now she has reached the credit so that she could maybe take an art or something different. Um, and she wasn't allowed to. So now she's, right now, I think writing a 10 page paper for a health class that she doesn't even need to have the credits for. So I just wanted to make that comment seeing that other parents are speaking up as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Carrie Culp, a full name and township residence, please. Hey guys, Matt Lismanis, East Coventry Township. Uh, I just wanted to underscore, uh, similar to some of the uh, comments being made by um, some of the other members of the public, when we talk about uh, the revenue loss associated with the cyber charters, I, I know that aspect of it is important from a budgetary perspective. But I do kind of feel like we're having the wrong conversation. I mean, we should be viewing um, the cyber domain as an area where we want to increase options, increase our services, and increase our offerings if we're hoping to retain students and also win them back from those cyber charter environments. And if you think about some of the topics being discussed tonight, you know, cyber options are an area where we could increase flexibility for students to accommodate some of the scheduling you know issues that folks have been mentioning um, in the discussion here so thanks so much thank you for your comment mr president that's the end of zoom public comment any objections to adjourn adjournment all right we're out of here folks thank you <laughs>